This video is sponsored by Opera GX. Have you, like me, lost control of your life and are constantly keeping open tabs you need to save for later, which are eating up precious resources on your computer? Well, you're in luck, because there's no need to worry about that anymore. Opera GX is a web browser built specifically for the gamer's sensibilities, allowing you to enhance your PC's performance while gaming and leaving tabs open by using its specialized GX control panel to limit its use of CPU or RAM while you're keeping busy. Just crank that sucker down and watch your lag disappear. And of course, that's not the only thing it has going for it, not by a country mile. You can use the network limiter to control your bandwidth usage and improve online game or stream performance. You can directly integrate and log into your social media channels like Twitter, Facebook Messenger, Discord, and WhatsApp to keep all of your feeds handy while you do other things. The integrated GX player allows you to sign directly into Spotify, Apple Music, or YouTube Music from your sidebar, and also conveniently pauses itself when you start streaming video or audio in the browser, resuming at its earliest convenience. You can customize your color scheme, stay up to date with free games, new releases, and breaking game news with the GX Corner tab, you have a built-in ad blocker and VPN, and best of all, you don't have to sacrifice all the info you've stored into your old browser, as the quick import tool allows you to bring everything over with just a few simple clicks. And Opera GX is also compatible with all Chrome Web Store extensions. With all these lovely features and more, plus a convenient on-the-go mobile app which can be connected to its desktop counterpart, you owe it to yourself to download Opera GX for free today. Just click on the link in the description below to find and install it, and press F to pay respects to traditional web browsers. Thank you so much to Opera GX for the sponsor, thank you for your support of this channel, and now without further ado, let's get this show started, shall we? Though through my channel's material I am mostly known for having grown up with a certain blue animal mascot, my high school years were a much different period of my life than my childhood. Despite that though, there was another, much stranger animal mascot that ended up occupying a lot of my brain space during my time in those hallowed halls. And similar to Sonic, heralding my obsession with platform games in my youth, he would usher me into an all-new appreciation for the medium of interactive storytelling. Yes, we're going there. Danganronpa Trigger Happy Havoc, or as I knew of it when first hearing of it, Danganronpa Academy of Hope and High School Students of Despair, is a peculiar game. Developed by Spike Chunsoft back when they were just called Spike, it released originally on the Sony PSP on November 25th of 2010, and only in Japan. Though it would finally see a North American release on the PS Vita on February 11th of 2014 and receive several ports afterward, this was not actually how I first heard of the game itself. Instead, I was captivated by a fan translation, a labor of love done in the form of a screenshot let's play by something awful forum user Oren Ronin, whose 147 part LP, which doubled as a translation of the game, spanned from November of 2011 all the way to December of 2012. This massively popular thread, which had a near serialized quality to it, gained notoriety at the very time the Tumblr Homestuck fandom was desperate for something to sink their teeth into, a large hiatus forcing them to find other things to do, and many of them found Danganronpa. With another popular fan translation by Project Zetsubo, which was an actually playable patch of the game's PSP release, that initial Western Tumblr fandom only continued to grow, its momentum peaking with the release of a 2013 anime adaptation of 13 episodes called Danganronpa the animation, which was officially subtitled in simulcast by Funimation. By the time the game got an official localization in 2014 by NIS America, there could be no doubt that the game whose PSP origins were originally passed up for English-speaking audiences had found a prospective place in the market due to its eclectic and unorthodox Western fandom, which had risen entirely out of fan efforts. Already, before we even get into the game itself, Danganronpa was setting some pretty bizarre trends that were definitely worth paying attention to. So then, what is the game actually about, you may say? What drew so much attention to it from a fandom who didn't even speak the primary language it was written in? Well, let me give you the rundown. Hope's Peak Academy, the home to Japan's best and brightest students, is a prestigious high school with a long history. Recruiting only the nation's most talented students, these students are not only regarded as top dog in their respective niche, but also as the entire country's beacons of hope for the future. Main character Makoto Naegi is something of an everyman among the den of wolves of such an impressive institution, having purely gotten in by chance, drawn by a yearly lottery as the apparent class patron of luck. Stepping timidly into the academy he so admires, his troubles have only just begun, however, as he finds himself spiraling into a strange haze, waking up in a classroom within the school that has notably taken on some odd changes. Security cameras and monitors dot every corner, metal plates are plastered all over the windows, and most importantly, he and his new classmates are under the dutiful instruction of a strangely twisted robotic teddy bear named Monokuma, a play on monochrome and kuma, the Japanese word for bear, obviously. Monokuma is quick to tell the students 
sense that they're completely cut off from the outside world, doomed to a communal life within the school's walls until the day they die, only offered the chance at freedom if they hasten that day for someone else. In other words, the only way to escape the school is to murder a fellow student, but it doesn't stop there. After each incident, there will be a mock court trial held within the school's underground area, where the students will have to debate the facts, present evidence, and come to a conclusion about who they think done it. If they reach the wrong conclusion, the killer goes free, allowed back into the outside world, with the remaining entire class being executed for their blunder. But conversely, if they reach the right conclusion, then the class will continue living their communal life, albeit with the new floor of the school unlocked for their access, and the killer alone will be executed for their crimes. With each new floor comes potential new clues and avenues to discover the secret identity of Monokuma's phantom controller, the secrets of Hope's Peak Academy, and hopefully, a way out. But there's a whole lot of blood to be shed before they can get there. This seemingly perfect chocolate and peanut butter-esque blend of Battle Royale and Ace Attorney sees you navigating many visual novel-style story scenes, exploring the school in a first-person perspective, investigating crime scenes when a crime occurs, and then ultimately taking your knowledge to the courtroom sections, where you'll be tasked with revealing the truth through a variety of game mechanics, logical reasoning, and the occasional minigame. It's a game that's greatest asset is, of course, its energetic story full of dire twists and turns, and its lovable extended cast of whom many stick out as charming and memorable, despite their inevitably gruesome fates. It exploded into a veritable franchise after its first outing, with many sequels, adaptations, and even tons of tie-in novels, some of which are really important, and some of which are largely untranslated. Great. Retrospect provides us with perspective, however, and a lot can change in the many years since I initially discovered Danganronpa. There are things about this game I've come not to like as much, but there are equally as many, if not more, parts of this game that I've really solidified my appreciation for. With the recent bundle release of this game and its two mainline sequels on Nintendo Switch, I couldn't help but feel the urge to return to it and examine all of those things under the lens of my current tastes, understandings, and life experiences. I wanted to know what exactly did I love so much about Danganronpa, and what about it do I still love enough to regard it as one of my favorite adventure games of all time? That, my friends, is exactly what we're here to discuss. This is not a spoiler-free affair, you should know, and this is a video that whether you care about spoilers or not will have no reluctance with exploring every nook and cranny of this game's story to craft its retrospective web. If you're simply looking for a recommendation, there are plenty of other videos for that out there. This is instead a look back on everything this game has to offer, an immersive dive both into its narrative quality and its history. This is an 11th anniversary retrospective of Danganronpa Trigger Happy Havoc. Danganronpa's history doesn't just begin with its release, though, of course. Before it eventually made its way to Japanese shelves in 2010, series director and main writer Kazutaka Kodaka had ideas tossing around in his head as early as 2007, during the development of a little PSP title called Distrust. During this period of time over at Spike HQ, the company was mostly pumping out sequels to existing franchises, and their original titles were very slim pickings. The company's desire for fresh blood was clear, and Kodaka responded to that perhaps a bit more literally than most would care to. Outlining his concept to producer Yoshinori Terasawa as a psychopop high school detective mystery, the game would be a pure visual novel with 2.5D motion graphics, a trial system where students are executed by majority vote, and featuring a wealth of graphic violence with decidedly red blood. Being worked on for the PSP due to its lower production costs, the game already found itself on difficult footing. For one, the PSP's library had low sales figures all around, and the game's somewhat niche genre meant that turning a profit would only be that much more difficult. The game's proposed level of violence also earned it issues in regards to its prospective zero rating, basically the Japanese equivalent of the ESRB. If the game was rated too highly, that meant it would only be more difficult to sell, especially on store shelves. Less stock would be put out, more direct requests would have to be made, and this certainly didn't bode well for a game already facing potential financial hurdles. This all, however, was not exactly what caused Kodaka to throw in the towel by the time 2009 had rolled around. Instead, it was a perceived lack of substance that ultimately drew Kodaka away from the project. Though the final game features many an element of over-the-top anime, a cute cartoon mascot, and striking hot pink blood, the mid-development images we have of distrust would be much more likely to affect this video's ad status, let's say. 
Much more traditional, less theatrical executions like a guillotine, a grimy splattered warehouse for its trial setting instead of the lavish round-robin courtroom, and a mascot character who instead of a sadistic stuffed animal was a slim good body looking small monochrome man with half of his skin missing. Despite all of the marketability and profit concerns all of this may have raised, the final nail in its coffin was ultimately the team's growing discomfort with it. Distrust was the original image of the game, obviously, and it was a psycho shock, said Kodaka in an interview with Polygon. So essentially, for us, that would be something like straight-up gruesome horror. However, when we were thinking about whether or not to do it, we felt that the audience for that was really small. Even in a place like America, the audience would still be small, but because the population's bigger, it might sell more. But at the end of the day, things of that nature that are that gruesome and that dark, the audience was too small for us to really want to pursue that to its end. So slowly but surely, the team scaled back their more horrific elements, adding more of a pop flavor. The pink blood of the final game, commonly thought to be a form of censorship, was not actually a choice made with the game's rating in mind. Instead, it was simply that red blood, according to Kodaka, just had no style to it. The team was going for a sort of horrific tone that was naturally accented by an almost twisted sense of levity, and even dark comedy. The pink blood, according to Kodaka, just worked to express that tone more accurately than the red would have managed. His waning interest in the project grew in intensity with each infusion of that trademark dark comedy in the midst of the violence with tonal cues, according to him, coming from over-the-top violent films like those of Quentin Tarantino. Even his reluctance to go through with one of the game's early concepts, a scene in which a character would be sliced to pieces, wasn't ditched for its gory proclivities. But instead, according to Kodaka, it's like the character loses his essence by doing that. Even though a character might die during the events of the game, provided they remain whole, I feel that they'll remain whole in the person's memory, and that character will still be cute or memorable or liked by the player. But if I were to actually have them be dismembered, the character would lose that sense of essence and that ability to remain within the player's imagination and memory. Just writing things that are cruel or gruesome or violent, it ends there, Kodaka said. There's nothing really interesting about that. And so with the game returned to the drawing board, distrust gradually became the Danganronpa we know today. Its plans for alternative branching paths and multiple endings to the story based on character deaths and execution being based on player choice would eventually slim down, coalescing into a single focused narrative with a set trajectory and a more cohesive sense of thematic purpose. The strange childlike organ creature known as Phantom would be ditched for the much more marketably mascot-like Monokuma. And though the game would still struggle through several phases of game mechanic and art style shifts, the the project rapidly began to take shape into what would eventually release on November 25th, 2010, Danganronpa Academy of Hope and High School Students of Despair. A pop art aesthetic combined with a more decidedly anime spin, a unique cutout sprite style, strange and vibrant first-person corridors, and a delightfully funky yet atmospheric musical score by Masafumi Takada brought the project to life. A strong identity of its own forged through the many trials it underwent, creating something almost instantly memorable and unique. The series title, Danganronpa, was a compound of the Japanese words for bullet, dangan, and the word for refutation, rompa, and refers to the game's core mechanic of presenting evidence in the courtroom section, truth bullets, which can be fired at contradictory statements to expose lies or errors in testimony and open up new paths of discussion. Despite being quite the risky venture for Spike, the game was released with the entire team waiting to see how it would perform, a large marketing push accompanying the October 10th release of a promotional demo for the game. Despite the obstacles standing in its way, Danganronpa received very favorable reviews from Japanese critics upon release, awarded with a pre-release rating of 36 out of 40 by popular game magazine Famitsu. Having sold 25,564 copies in its first week, debuting in 8th place in the weekly game sales charts, word of mouth quickly spread, launching it to 85,000 copies sold within just the first three months of its release. Having quickly met its sales goal, Danganronpa became an instant cult success, ensuring that it was not only a success for Spike, but the start of a franchise. But hey, this is a video about the first game here, so let's keep on topic, shall we? If this video performs well enough, maybe we'll talk about those sequels soon enough. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. As mentioned previously, the game's prologue puts us in the shoes of main character Makoto Naegi. Having been drawn from a lottery to attend the school as opposed to all the other students who were selected because of their specific talents, he's dubbed as having the super high school level luck. 
And um, yeah, quick aside, this game's localization's kind of weird. I know a lot of people like and prefer it, and that's totally cool. It's a fine translation. But some of the terminology, as an old guard fan, ain't my cup of tea. I'm saying SHSL in this video, not Ultimate, and I'm calling the characters by their last names for the most part, not their first names. And especially not the weird dub nicknames. Whew, I do not understand why that in particular gets under my skin so much, but it just does. Besides that, not to go on a ramble real quick, but I just don't think Ultimate really conveys the same feeling as Super High School Level was supposed to in the original game's script. A lot of people cite that SHSL is cumbersome, wordy, and awkward sounding, but I would like to offer in response to that that it does in Japanese too. To me, it kind of felt like the point, I guess. Hope's Peak is such an extra place that places so much emphasis on talent to an almost absurd extent, a characteristic which would only face more direct and pointed scrutiny in later sequels. So this over-exaggerated, near self-important sounding quality of what is essentially just saying you're the best at something for a high schooler, to me at least, conveys this sense of kind of silly theatricism, accenting just how bizarre the school really is. By contrast, Ultimate is such a generic catch-all for the idea of expressing the level of someone's talent that it just kind of loses all of that nuance for me. That said, it's again not the end of the world that they localized it this way. I don't think that it makes the game worse off or anything. I'm just expressing how I specifically feel the change doesn't quite represent the original intent as well as I'd hope, and why I personally never use the term myself. Also, imagine someone as uptight as Ishimaru asking people to call him by an informal nickname. Could not be me. Anywho, upon arriving at Hope's Peak, the stuff we talked about before happens. Locked school, talented students, murdery teddy bear, killing game, you get the basic gist. This prologue basically leads up to that point, where the game's trademark sense of unease first begins to make itself known, in a particularly striking scene where, in the midst of the gem Monokuma has left them in, Everyone begins to look around at each other, the realization settling in the pit of their stomach that although none of them want to consider the possibility, there could be someone among them at that very moment plotting to take another person's life. It's this sort of surprising and isolative tension that already makes the game's scenario so captivating at the onset, and it's the promise of things only becoming worse from here on out that solidifies that captivation. But of course, this prologue also introduces us to all of our central characters in the class, many of whom will be developed more as time marches onward. Let's briefly, as briefly as we can anyway, please bear with me, go over all of them so we're all on the same page about who they are, what their talent is, and what their name is so you're not weirded out when I use a lot of their surnames to refer to them, and also so we don't have to spend too much time elaborating on these things when in reference to the actual plot. We're not really going to touch on voice actors too much, despite Danganronpa's all-star studded cast arguably being one of the first major components that led to its success in the original Japanese release, but I will say it's an excellent cast with a lot of iconic names on it. Just go through a search of them on Wikipedia or something, you will find a lot of fascinating links you would not expect. The dub is pretty okay too, even if I don't happen to personally prefer it. We've already gone over the main character, Naegi, whose talent is luck, or perhaps a lack of it. He's just sort of the everyman, and despite having a penchant for sarcasm and the ability to focus his determination shown in protag style, is the character I reasonably have the least to say about, seeing as he's basically the player insert. He's not a bad character by any means, but there's just not a lot to go into here. Aoi Asahina is the super high school level swimmer, an oft airheaded but energetic girl with a penchant for donuts and a constant energy for exercise and competition. Byakuya Togami is the super high school level heir, a pompous and self-centric scion who is set to lead his affluent family lineage in the future and whose priorities never quite seem to line up with his peers, mostly due to his standoffish nature and penchant for pissing people off with either derogatory remarks or his seeming willingness to entertain the premise of the killing game itself. Celestia Ludenberg was my crush when I was in high school. Let me try that again. Celestia Ludenberg is the super high school level gambler, an aficionado of gothic Lolita fashion, whose eccentric tastes for high society and devilish luck have brought her to great prominence as the apparent queen of liars, and whose prim demeanor is rarely broken by an unseen tendency to seethe with anger. Chihiro Fujisaki is the super high school level programmer. Shy but well-meaning, she often fades into the background of conversations due to her unimposing nature, but nevertheless contains an incredible intellect and set of computer skills. Hifumi Yamada is the super high school level doujin author, a nerd's nerd who often speaks in obscure pop culture references and whose interests seemingly only lie in the fictional, and particularly the fictionally erotic. 
Junko Enoshima is the super high school level gyaru, which is a Japanese fashion subculture defined by its rebellious, non-conforming style at direct odds with the typically expected housewife image of Japanese society, earning it a general perception of being too racy and commonly associated with juvenile delinquency or frivolousness among teenage girls. True to this image, Junko is brash, materialistic, and fashion conscious, with a strong sense of independence and a tendency to say what's on her mind. Kiyotaka Ishimaru is the super high school level hall monitor, a rigid and energetic stickler for authority and rule of law, whose serious demeanor and lack of social tact often leads to him causing unintended friction with his peers despite his best efforts to the contrary. Kyoko Kirigiri, though introduced with a big old question mark for a talent, is eventually revealed to be the super high school level detective, and her demeanor shows it pretty clearly. Though seemingly cold and analytical, she has an oft hidden side of occasional warmth that she shows to those close to her, although she can become equally as vindictive when her loyalties are strained. Leon Kuwata is the super high school level baseball player, a seemingly chill guy who prefers the life of a rock star to the one he's been saddled with as a sports legend, aiming to become a singer sometime in the future. Mondo Uwata is the super high school level gang leader, a fiery and foul-mouthed delinquent who, despite his intimidating aura, does at least seem to have a fierce loyalty to those he deems his chosen family. Sakura Ogami is the super high school level fighter, a muscle-bound warrior whose chiseled exterior may on first glance obscure her gentle nature. Despite her unparalleled physical prowess and combat ability, she is also a very kind-hearted and self-sacrificial person, who often tries to see the best in others. Sayaka Maizano is the super high school level idol, the bubbly headliner of a popular girls group whose typically cutesy demeanor masks a rigid determination to succeed. Despite her regularly kind-hearted attitude, her insistence on becoming Naegi's Maya Fey-esque assistant character, and her heavy presence in the promotional material of the game suggesting the same, can her slight duplicitousness survive this character culling? Ooh, yeah, who knows? Toko Fukawa is the super high school level writer, a fiercely withdrawn and neurotic girl whose romance novels spawn from her fantasy of being genuinely liked. The seeming inability to gain access to this kind of affection throughout her life has spawned a nasty inferiority complex, which seemingly goes hand in hand with an almost fetishistic temptation to seek people who will degrade or treat her poorly. Yasuhiro Hagakure is the super high school level fortune teller, an older student by virtue of being held back twice who is as lax and humor-filled as often as he is bizarre and prone to wild speculation. And finally, our lovably murderous headmaster Monokuma is the mascot that ties this disparate cast together, quite literally, trapping them inside of the school and despite demanding the horrible task of killing from them all, maintaining a zany and comedic cruelty often accented by irreverent humor and fourth wall breaking gags. In Japanese, he's extremely notably voiced by Nobuyo Oyama, which is the only VA I feel I have to make time to mention in this insanely long script, because she's likely a large part of why many Japanese players picked the game up in the first place, and I can't overstate that enough. The reason for that is that despite having very few unique voiceover credits to her name, Oyama was the primary voice of Japanese cultural icon and children's anime legend Doraemon for nearly three decades, spanning from 1979 to 2005, which included hundreds of television episodes and 33 feature films. To put this into perspective, hearing Oyama's Monokuma as a resident of Japan would be like hearing the voice of Winnie the Pooh or Mickey Mouse that you grew up with suddenly talking about forcing high school students to murder each other. It's the perfect kind of perverse cognitive dissonance that makes Monokuma such an effectively iconic villain. With all of our central cast introduced and our prologue said and done, let's proceed on into the first chapter proper, shall we? Chapter 1 starts slow and steady, allowing you to get to know the layout of the academy itself and the flow of the gameplay. The game setting is atmospherically oppressive, claustrophobic, and makes sure to hammer home the sort of distorted lack of perception that comes with being trapped in an isolated place like this, danger lurking at every potential corner. The lack of natural light peeking in creates a sort of spatial unawareness or feeling of being caught up in some temporal abnormality, never really sure what's real and what isn't, as you spend your days fearing the worst may, at any time, occur once again. Story events compel you to explore certain areas and engage in lengthy dialogue with your fellow students most of the time, with occasional breakups allowing you to spend your allotted free time with any character you wish, though you'll have to be quick about some of those bonds considering that somebody may wind up dead soon. Engaging in free time events allows you to grow closer to certain characters, which will earn you some of their backstory or tidbits about their personal lives as well as either special skills or skill points, the latter being used to equip the former during class trials, with different skills easing the difficulty of the mechanics in some specific ways. 
Sometimes you'll have to answer a question during free time events, which can sour your companion to you if you choose incorrectly, and often you're prompted to present a gift to precede the talk, of which you can acquire many at the school store with mono coins, in-game currency hidden in different interactable areas in the school, or gained through completion of class trials. Of course, you'll have to make sure the gift is something that the character actually likes, which can be a process of trial and error at times without a guide, though some should be fairly obvious if you pay keen attention to their personalities. Much of the first few days is dedicated both to exploring the school to look for possible escapes or clues, and getting to know who ostensibly appears to be your assistant and sidekick character for the foreseeable future, Sayaka Maizano, a poppy and cheerful girl idol who often seems to read Naegi's inner monologue and respond to it, joking that she's psychic, but then insisting that she just has very good intuition. Of course, very little turns up in the way of escape, and tensions rise between the students as their search proves more futile. Still, no murder seems to occur quite yet, which provides you ample time to discuss all of these things with Maizano herself, who also tells you about how she needs to get back out to her fellow idol group members, noting that the industry is so fierce and frantic that her dream, which she worked so hard for, even did some not-so-great things for, may be swept under the tide and completely forgotten if she doesn't. As a somewhat D-list internet personality, I may live on the very far periphery of that kind of fame, but that kind of concern is no stranger to me, so I definitely feel for her. I feel for her enough that I don't question it at all when she's looking to acquire some kind of item for self-defense, though she ultimately doesn't end up taking it, giving it to you instead. This friendly back and forth between friends can't last forever though, of course, as Monokuma quickly appears to claim that he's figured out the missing ingredient he needs to kickstart the bloodshed, motive. Gathering everyone in the AV room, Monokuma shows them videotapes of the most important relationships in their lives being torn asunder, threatening the dissolution of everything that matters to them, and then leaving the outcome of that upheaval tantalizingly unanswered by the end, promising only to elaborate upon a student's graduation. Though it's terrifying to consider anyone capable of taking this so closely to heart that they would kill, it certainly doesn't seem off the table. Maizano doesn't seem to think so either, coming to your room in the dead of night to ask if she can switch rooms for the night with you. The reason? Apparently, somebody has been trying to force their way into her room, and she's terrified of what that could possibly mean. Of course, so are you, so you gladly switch room keys with her and follow through, only hesitating for a moment to point out to her that the bathroom door is misaligned. Something helpfully pointed out to you by Monokuma earlier due to the fact that the boys' dorm bathrooms don't actually have locks. Come on, dude, what the hell? Arriving to the cafeteria meetup in the morning, it seems, predictably, someone is missing, and unfortunately, it's Mizuno. Rushing back to your room that she stayed in for the night, you find it unlocked and absolutely trashed with signs of a struggle. In the bathroom, you find her body. As typical as this may seem, I need to emphasize that Maizuno was all over this game's ad campaign. Her assistant role is nigh traditional of detective adventure games of this nature, and everything about her insisted that she would be the typical sidekick slash love interest. She was even in the demo version of the first trial, released a month before the game's retail arrival, which incidentally featured Hagakure as the first victim who, spoilers, doesn't even die in the final game at all. They really threw people for a loop here, as all the buildup had consistently and silently insisted that Maizuno would not only be a character who lived throughout, but would be an important and consistent asset to the player. Instead, she's dead within the first few hours of this 20 plus hour game, and oh buddy, the crazy train is only just getting started. Grief-stricken and terrified, Nayagi passes out almost instantly upon seeing the corpse, which, uh, yeah, don't blame him, and awakens in the gym where Monokuma outlines the whole class trial thing I mentioned earlier. Oh yeah, that's another important thing. He uh, didn't mention that until now. You see, during the first lovely gym tutorial to their school life, Monokuma only mentions the killing part, not the mock court trial where your life is on the line part, which means the culprit of this first murder had no idea their every action was going to be under such scrutiny and ultimately putting them at risk for execution. Either way though, tactfully explained or not, most of the class has no desire to participate in these proceedings, with Junko's objections even raising to the level of stomping on Monokuma. Unfortunately for her, this violation of the school rules leads to Monokuma suddenly springing a spear trap from the floor, impaling and killing her near instantaneously, making her both the second dead body in the last 10 minutes, and a potently frightening example to the rest of the students what the risks of disobeying him really are. 
Left to their devices, it takes little time for the rest of the students to notice that Maizano's body was found in Naiki's dorm. And given that nobody else knew about the room switching thing, his word does little to persuade them that he's not the murderer, which saddles you with the tall order of not only solving Maizano's fresh murder, but acquitting yourself of your own friend's killing turnabout sister style because people clearly haven't compared this game to Ace Attorney enough yet. Despite the room being Naegi's, however, the strangest part about its dilapidated state is actually a surprising lack of any hair whatsoever being present in it. This combined with the mysterious dying message left behind the body, a shattered crystal ball, and bloody shirt tatter left behind the closed garbage room grate next to the incinerator, and the strange way your bathroom doorknob appears to have been unscrewed, all coalesces into an interesting set of clues that you make your way underground with. And the debate, finally, begins. This is where you're first introduced to the class trial and its many mechanics, starting with the non-stop debate. This flings you into a conversation where text will float on the screen as the characters take turns arguing their points. In your arsenal is your truth bullets, your ammunition that you shoot out at said words when they're highlighted. If a highlighted statement contradicts one of the truth bullets at your disposal, you take aim and shoot, crashing through those words to end the non-stop debate and proceed the discussion in a new direction. This is the main mechanic you'll be dealing with aside from casual multiple choice questions, and it's rather intuitive, working very well as a substitute to the more traditional Ace Attorney style of testimony and cross-examination. Occasionally, though, you will also have to perform a hangman's gambit, which is a pretty boring fill-in-the-blank sequence where letters float in a void and you have to shoot them to fill in the term. A less impressive minigame, to be sure. Despite using what proof you can to disarm the theory that you had anything to do with the killing, it quickly becomes clear that the room switching was a lot more sinister than you suspected, for different reasons altogether. Signs from the struggle point to the likely sequence of events being an attack that was led by Maizano, with her killing resulting from retaliation rather than an original intent to kill. It seems Maizano's shining to you, her attempt to become your assistant, and her plea for your help in defending herself from a midnight attacker were all false pretenses to murder someone in your room and then pin the blame on you. Before you can even wrap your head around her unexpected death, they're already making you reckon with the idea that she was out to betray your trust. And this cruel twist of the knife in your back isn't at all given any time to slow down before the next big shocker arrives. The code on the back wall, drawn from Maizano's perspective and using her non-dominant hand as the other wrist was broken in the struggle, seems to spell out a message of English letters, L-E-O-N, implicating the baseball star Leon Kuwata himself. I've heard people complain that this mystery is pretty lackluster because of its obviousness after this point, and to a point, I see where they're coming from. But one thing to keep in mind is that this dying message is not actually a product of the localization. In fact, the localization changes nothing about this message from the original Japanese, and that's why it's so much easier for us than it was to natively Japanese players, because they had to actually wrap their head around English, whereas we can just read it by default. Nevertheless, this huge shift in the case squarely placed everyone's sights on Leon, who naturally denies everything. However, his fate is sealed when you're able to extrapolate, thanks to his talent as a baseball player, that he was able to use Hagakure's stolen crystal ball to fling through the great door of the garbage room, hit the button to open and activate the incinerator, and then throw his bloody shirt into the fire, only just barely missing a scrap that he didn't catch. It's at this point you'll be tasked with the last two of the class trial's unique and mainstay minigames, the Climax Reasoning and Bullet Time Battle sections. Climax Reasoning is pretty self-explanatory, acting as an abridged manga version of the crime summary with blank panels breaking up the sequences. Below this are a selection of panels which can fill in the blanks, and so it's up to you to correctly arrange these blank panels to make sure the narrative mirrors a correct summary of the events, which will ultimately act as your sort of case-closed finisher that recaps the whole thing before the class votes. The BTB is a little less self-explanatory, acting as a sort of clumsy rhythm minigame to weaken a stubborn classmate's resolve, usually the killers. Once you bring down their hearts by performing well in the minigame, you're given the opportunity to seal the deal with the final truth bullet shot to their last protests, testing your reflexes as you quickly select the correct evidence to put their argument to rest. This one is not very fun at all. Utterly defeated, Leon admits that a note from Maizano lured him to the room she specified. When inside, thinking he was to engage in a peaceful, casual chat, he was attacked by Maizano with a kitchen knife. Reacting to defend himself, he grabbed the prop sword in the room and blocked her attack with its sheath, using it to break her wrist and make her drop the knife. Grabbing the knife in a wild attempt to defend himself, Leon drove Maizano into the bathroom, which he couldn't access because of its misalignment. 
Thinking himself to be in Mizuno's room rather than Nayagi's, he mistakenly assumed that the door was locked, returning to his own room to get his toolkit from the drawer, then returning to unscrew the knob, forcing his way in and stabbing Mizuno. With the deed done, he cleaned the room thoroughly, made his way to the laundry room to try washing his shirt, and saw the crystal ball Hagakure left mistakenly behind there, formulating his plan. The scrap he missed implicating him in his toolkit sure to show signs of being used, he's unable to deny it anymore, and is sentenced to his death, which he pleads horrifyingly not to face. Despite his bargaining that he was acting purely in self-defense, Celeste is quick to point out that he could have stopped when Mizuno shut herself in the bathroom, but chose at that point to go out of his way to finish the job. Dragged into a room made to look like a mock batting cage by Monokuma, Leon is strapped to a pole and pelted with countless baseballs from a pitching machine, bludgeoning him until he goes limp. As everyone watches on in horror, a third death having happened within the school's walls in just a few short days. Terrified by what they've all seen, Monokuma mocks the students, and especially Nayagi, for his sense of justice and indignance over all this, delivering one of his surprisingly many strangely poignant lines, which I think go a long way to characterize Monokuma's outlook on the world, and conversely, the opposing viewpoint to Nayagi's own, already beginning to craft a thematic debate that will serve as the story's core and driving force. But you know, there's nothing more immoral than a sense of justice. Isn't a bunch of guys brandishing their justice the reason we still have wars? Is that the reason you suddenly have a sense of justice? Despite those haunting words, however, the despair of the situation is cushioned by a bit of hope. Kirigiri pulls Nayagi aside, which he correctly guesses is to talk about Mizuno. Trying in some small way to comfort him, she notes that Mizuno likely wouldn't have written a dying message that so clearly implicated her attacker if she felt no concern for what might happen to Nayagi in the end. She reasons that Mizuno, despite her tenacity, was just as unsure and frightened as anyone else by the possibility of taking a life by her own hands, and that uncertainty, though proving to be her downfall, still proved that she wasn't heartless. She had her own complicated, flawed, but ultimately human reasons for doing what she did, and though her actions may have aimed to betray Naegi, not all of them implied a lack of care for him. She also reasons that Naegi's determination and budding detective skills means he will likely be able to move on from these deaths and not let them destroy him inside, to which he responds in what I think is a truly defining character moment, that he will never move on from their deaths and will carry them forward with him for the rest of his life, along with their memories. Smiling a bit, she responds that although it's clearly the harder path to take, she believes that he might be capable of walking it. Quickly wrapping up, she asks Naiki how he knew she wanted to discuss Mizuno in particular, to which he pauses, then responds, because I'm psychic, as she always did. When Kirigiri acts surprised, he follows suit with the second part. Just kidding, I just have really good intuition. Ending chapter one. This chapter, though it starts slow, really picks up once it gets going, and even in the slow sections, does an excellent job building the character of Mizuno, especially if you bother to do her free time events. The way her duality is so deftly emphasized makes it clearer than anything else how tragic this whole situation is, forcing people who might otherwise be mostly kind or good into a place where they feel forced to do unspeakable or selfish things. But even then, could we really blame them either? It's easy to give a condemnation when standing outside of their shoes, but it's another thing entirely to be put into that position yourself. The mystery element is a bit admittedly lackluster, of course, but the translation difficulties involved combined with this only being the first case of the game makes its lack of relative difficulty a bit more understandable and easy to overlook in my eyes. All of the emotional elements at play here combine very effectively, not only to provide a uniquely tragic look at human nature, but also, in short order, to tell you exactly what this game will be like and what it will be about. Tragedy intermingles with sentimentality, emotion is enriched by understanding, and that emotion is preyed upon by the deeply ironic and devastating twists that lay ahead of us. As we proceed into Chapter 2, we finally think we know what we're in for. And to an extent, we do, but also, we have no idea. Chapter 2 allows us to get our first look at the opening of a new floor of the school, with a prompt exploration revealing that there's a library and a pool, complete with accompanying locker rooms open for our access now. Furthermore, the bathhouse in the dorm area is now accessible too. Despite this seeming like a nice addition to the student's school life, however, there's still a very apparent dilemma reached upon the end of their search the fact that there's still no kind of exit in sight. The tension this provokes is only hammered further in by Togami's further and repeated insistence that none of them are friends and should only be looking out for ways to screw each other over rather than dreaming of an alliance. 
Of course, just because an exit hasn't been found doesn't mean that no clues have turned up. A mysterious letter left sealed in the library seems to be a kind of notice from the Academy's board, noting that a large-scale incident had forced them to close their doors at least a year prior to now. Which certainly raises questions from the students, considering that they recall nothing major happening concerning the school just prior to their entry. There's also a laptop found in the library, but it doesn't appear to power on. Furthermore, the students have begun speculating more and more about who could possibly be responsible for trapping them in their current situation, and the suggestion arises that perhaps a famous serial killer named Genocider Sho could be responsible. In the localization, this murderous fiend's name is Genocide Jack, and while as an old fan I tend to prefer the original name, we'll be getting into why the change was likely necessary later on in the chapter discussion. Your hope that no unnecessary infighting will arise after such a dire time in the last chapter can only continue undisturbed for so long, of course. It seems Ishimaru's strict disciplinary attitude is rubbing up against Owada's irreverence and defiance in the face of authority, and the two challenge each other to a contest of sitting in the bathhouse sauna all night, waiting to see who will chicken out first. Though you stay behind for a little while to observe by their request, you eventually relent to sleep, hoping desperately that nothing bad will happen by the time you wake up. Thankfully, it seems your fears were for nothing when morning comes, as Awada and Ishimaru have formed something of a strong manly bond, as it were. Their friendship is simple but strong, and acts as something of an irritant to everyone else around them, due to their enthusiastic ramblings. Speaking of unexpected developments, it seems Fukawa has come to you for the purpose of going to the library together. While this may at first seem an attempt to get to know you, it's actually a candid attempt to get to know Tagami, who she's seemingly fallen hard and fast for because of his pompous disposition rather than despite it. Of course, he doesn't take the bait either way, shooing both of you out of his study session and telling Fukawa to get a bath, something she interprets less as the insult it is and more as a plea for her to take care of herself, furthering her somewhat perverse delusionary attachment to the boy. Oh dear, not something to get involved in, I think it should go without saying. All of these shenanigans, combined with your opportunities for spending free time with someone, will, while not putting the recent deaths entirely out of your mind, still offer you enough space from them to fool yourself into thinking that life could possibly continue like this for a while longer. Suddenly, though, the sharp atmospheric dread comes back into full force, with Monokuma calling everyone spontaneously to the gym to give you his next motive for murder, and remind you of how truly alone you are once again. This time, he's distributed little slips to everyone containing their deepest and darkest secrets, with the promise that unless someone dies come tomorrow, he'll have no choice but to reveal all of those secrets to the world. While Naegi seems personally banal, only speaking of how long it took him to stop wetting the bed, it's easy to speculate that the secrets of others may not be so innocent. And it's Togami who again speaks up to deliver a harsh observation, that although many couldn't imagine murdering someone over something like this, it's a foolish mistake to assume others have only their own standards, because for some, it may very well be possible indeed. And of course, this only seems to be scarily implied further by what follows, Ishimaru suggesting they all tell each other their secrets on the spot to avoid any motive for murder being possible. But while some seem okay with that prospect, others falter. It doesn't seem like they want to share, and it's that uncertainty that lingers over your head as you head to your dorms, almost certain that by the time you wake up, something will have gone horribly wrong once again. When you awaken to Monokuma leering over your bed, a frightening change of pace to be sure, you're pretty certain you already know the answer to that question now. And if you didn't, he makes it perfectly clear to you anyway. Like a giddy schoolchild who wants you to see his drawing, he makes it no secret to you that something's happened and he's in desperate need of everyone to discover it as soon as possible. After only mere days, another crime has occurred. And though it may take you a short while to arrive at your destination, once Monokuma makes a note of unlocking restricted areas for investigation as you're standing in the locker room, it becomes all too clear where you need to go. Throwing open the girls' locker room door, you're faced with another nightmare, the death of Chihiro Fujisaki. Her body suspended horrifically with a message on the wall clearly not written by her, this crime is simultaneously very sudden, horrific, and revealing. Earlier talks of Genocider show yielded the information that his calling card was evidently a message at the crime scene written in blood that matches this one. And while initial arguments could be made that this was a copycat killer, Togami is quick to point out that the library archive's file on the slaughterer describes his unique way of suspending the corpses of his victims, a fact replicated in Chihiro's death, and one that is only known to higher-ups in law enforcement, meaning it's not something that the general public would have any way of knowing. The files further imply that because of the killer's schedule and odd behavior, they may be a student with dissociative identity disorder, which... Yeah, okay, I have some comments about that, but we'll save them for the trial. 
Mysterious elements compound one after the other at this point. Fukawa faints at the sight of the crime scene, but awakens acting stranger than usual, only to then retreat into her room and start muttering something about not letting genocide or show win. A broken E handbook is discovered in the main hall, along with the handbooks of the deceased Mizuno and Junko. But when it's speculated that the broken one must be Leon's because of his intense execution, Monokuma is insistent that such a pummeling would not be enough to break a handbook, as it's only vulnerable to very specific weaknesses, with force being completely unrelated to that. Furthermore, strange signs of many things in the locker rooms switching places between the two appear to be evident, like their respective posters and even a stain on the boys' locker room carpet, corresponding to a stain that Sakura admits to having made on the girls' locker room carpet. And of course, there's also the matter of why Chihiro seemingly died from a blow to the head from a nearby dumbbell, as opposed to the usual method of genocide or show killings, multiple stab wounds from ornate scissors. There are so many more factors to consider here than in the first trial, and though it certainly makes for a better mystery than the last, you're bound to have much less of an idea of who the culprit may be when entering that elevator once again. As you descend, the crowd shot of the class has noticeably grown less packed, a grim reminder of how many lives have been lost and how many are more likely to follow from this point. The curtain opens on the next class trial, and I'll just go ahead and be honest with you guys, this is my least favorite case in the game. There are definitely elements of this case that I enjoy, and from a purely structural perspective, I will say that it definitely has its strengths over others, particularly the third, which many will be quick to point out as their least favorite for a variety of reasons, more of which we'll get into as we cover it. But this one in particular really hits a couple of sore spots for me, which I'll be trying my best to outline over the course of this summary without dwelling too much, because I'll be honest, it just upsets me to talk about, and I already know the comments aren't bound to be kind to me over it. First, let's start with the bits that bother me less. The beginning of the trial, which revolves around unmasking the identity of Genocider Sho and seeing whether or not the theory of his involvement really holds any water. It takes very little time to identify that because of Fukawa's strange shift in demeanor and her withdrawn behavior, that she is in fact Genocider Sho, or at least Genocider Sho is her alter, the result of a DID-induced split, the result of some unspoken trauma we're not quite privy to. This is actually the reason the name had to be changed in localization from Genocider Sho to Genocide Jack, as Sho is a very common male name in Japanese, leading the characters and player to this point to naturally assume that Sho is a man. So to reveal that it's actually a schoolgirl Girl presents something of an unexpected surprise, only predicated on the audience's assumptions, but never having lied to achieve it. Which obviously wouldn't work as well with a Western audience, considering Sho is not a name we could easily identify as commonly male or female, thus necessitating the need for a Western substitute that gets across the same point. A common male name like, say, Jack. Of course, name scheming aside, we've got to touch on that whole DID thing now. Media portrayals of people with DID as exclusively deranged murderers is nothing particularly new. Media like Split still proves that this is quite a common and popular trope, in fact. But something I should hope most people recognize is that this is extremely untrue. While instances of instability and violence among the mentally ill and those with dissociative disorders is not something that has never happened, it is extremely rare when compared to the almost saturated representation of this trope in fictional characters with DID. To put it simply, the crazy serial killer alter genre of character is often little more than a cruel stereotype of a group of people who already have enough trouble living their lives as is, without every movie, television show, and game that features someone with their condition telling everybody that they're all violent lunatics. The Hangman's Gambit minigame to unearth Fukawa's condition even has you spelling out this little term, which is particularly gross, not just because it's misrepresentative, but it's an extremely derogatory term for the mentally ill in general. You can blame this one more so on the localization, however, as the original Japanese Hangman's Gambit section actually has you spelling out the term DID instead. That being said, it's not as if I have nothing good to say about this twist or this character. On the contrary, I do find Sho herself, barring the premise, to be kind of a riot. She's very fun and energetic despite her frankly horrifying proclivities, and plus her role in the trial is honestly very interestingly subverted from the usual role a character like her would take here. Keep in mind, her reveal in the trial happens almost nigh instantly, and the amount of time it takes you to reach this startling revelation is inevitably short enough to clue you into the fact that she's not the killer. In any other game, this reveal about Fukawa and Sho would take until the end of the entire chapter to reach, her probing medical history being the decisive evidence to reveal her cartoonish sinister side and then, I don't know, like get her warded or something? But here we go into painstaking detail about Sho's methods of killing, her modus operandi, and yes, the fact that she is indeed some 
somebody who just kills tons of men for perverse sport, only to realize that the whole thing is off. Chihiro is suspended by an extension cord rather than her trademark scissors, something she's quick to point out she has on her even now, and the killing blow was again with a dumbbell, something she thinks has no finesse. To top it off, the bloody message which acts as her trademark is something she's correct to mention would serve her no advantage in leaving behind in this enclosed setting where suspects are abound. It would only lead to her own discovery and execution at that rate, after all. For all of the typical tropes I dislike about her condition, it's the very fact that she embodies this tropey role that underlies just how unexpected it is that she's not the actual culprit. Like I said before, in any other game, she would be, but as it stands, Sho just happens to be a murderer. And this fact bears no real significance on the plot at large, which is something that, if nothing else, I find so atypical and advantageous to throwing mystery readers off that it just makes it a bit hilarious, if nothing else. Hats off for that one. But hey, if it wasn't the obvious serial killer, then who was it? Perhaps the only other guy in the room who knows about all the stuff she gets up to? One that was seen in the library with an extension cord quite often? Yeah, the next obvious fit seems to be Togami, but all of his combined suspicious behavior only makes this theory seem too obvious. More than that, he's seemingly more than happy to lead you through the discussion of his actions like he's completely unrelated to the crime itself. And though you eventually get him to admit that he arranged the body to mirror a genocide or show crime and draw her out, he's also quick to solidify something else. He didn't do it either. He just found the body already bludgeoned and decided to set this whole charade up to make the second trial more of an interesting one and less open and shut than the first was. Which, while certainly detestable in its own way, does not make him a culprit. Now it's back to the drawing board, and it seems like everyone's losing track of where to go from here. That's when Kirigiri suggests that they all take a recess to return to the crime scene for a moment, something she convinces Monokuma will shake things up enough to warrant permitting, and will also give the rest of the class great insight into how their discussion must proceed. And this is where I frankly lose all affection for this case. Let me go ahead and say, ahead of time, for the swath of inevitable angry commenters, that I get it. I did not misunderstand anything the game said here. I did not misunderstand the intent of the story or the characters. I fully grasp the intention, the narrative, and the aim of every included aspect here. I just don't like the way it was handled. And more and more often I find, especially in the realm of YouTube criticism, that it seems almost impossible to point out something that you dislike about a story you otherwise enjoy without people interpreting it as an attack on the entire work or a condemnation of the entire thing and its fans. Let me be blunt. This is childish. I really, really liked Danganronpa when I first played it, and I still do, but that doesn't mean that I have to love every aspect of it. Just because there are things about it that I indeed find objectionable does not for a second mean that I have completely dismissed what I do enjoy about it, or suggested that it all now lacks substance. Criticizing the media you enjoy is, by my estimation anyway, a very important part of the media process because it enables those making media to take those criticisms into account, and perhaps work off of them in the future. It doesn't necessarily mean that everyone will agree with those criticisms, and in fact, this applies to creators as well. But I'm not going to willfully pretend like the things I enjoy are spotless and perfect simply because I otherwise enjoy them. That would be doing a disservice, I think, because when Danganronpa is good, it's often great. And that means that when it isn't, I want it to do better, because I already know it can. That's why I have to put my foot down and say that the whole reveal and discussion surrounding Chihiro's gender is, I think, handled very poorly. Yeah, the whole reason for the locker room switch, the reason for Chihiro's secrecy and reluctance, and indeed even the entire murder itself, all revolve in some way around this dramatic reveal of Chihiro being male. And while many would be quick to point out that this is not aiming to explicitly be a trans narrative, in fact contradicting the notion quite significantly at one point, I still don't think people quite understand what would rub some so wrongly about this. I don't want to spend too much time on the subject, not only because it makes me nervous and uncomfortable, but because I know even mentioning it is going to invite a lot of sh** my way. But I can't in good conscience gloss completely over it though, so just allow me my little piece and then I'll get off my soapbox. The way Chihiro is spoken about, the way much of their behavior lines up with that experience, even if the intention isn't there, the parallels certainly glaringly are. And this makes the discussion surrounding it and the sort of grossly invasive shock it's treated with seem like a mockery of that experience to an extent that I hope some could be compassionate enough to see why it makes me uncomfortable. And trust me, it did. I knew going into this replay that this part would likely be a bit rough for me, but I didn't anticipate how ill I would actually end up feeling at times during it. 
For those who have never personally struggled with their gender identity or even just their gender presentation, I have no doubt that many of you will not have a problem personally with getting through this, and this critique may in fact seem overblown or silly to you. But let me tie my perspective back to something mentioned earlier in this very chapter, Togami's apt observation that you can't assume everyone operates by your own standards. What's possible for some may be impossible for others. Their personal circumstances inform their limits, their perspectives, and their actions. And mine make it very difficult for me to see this subject's handling here as anything but clumsy at the least and cruel at its worst. That all aside, it's at this point we start to unravel the circumstances behind the crime. Tohiro's struggle with their secret up for reveal prompted their foray into exercise, an attempt to become stronger and work up the courage to discuss these matters openly with peers. Eyeing for someone loyal and strong who would help with this and could be trusted to stay quiet in the meantime, they sought the help of Iwata, whose secret unfortunately clashed with their own in a truly unfortunate way. Having been mistakenly responsible for his own older brother's sacrificial death, Owada developed a complex about his own strength similar to Chihiro's complex about their own weakness. Thus already riled up about the potential of his horrific secret being revealed, he's stunned when Chihiro admits their own so freely, demonstrating a need to overcome that fear. In a way, he's jealous of that kind of strength, the kind of strength that everyone assumes he has, but he knows he doesn't and in a fit of rage spurred by his own self-loathing, he blacks out, coming to after having delivered the final killing blow. In a bid to keep Chihiro's secret from escaping the confines of the boys' locker room where the murder took place, Iwata tries to at least honor that much by swapping the scenes, having swapped his own broken E handbook, which had shorted due to the temperature of the sauna with Leon's in the main hall, and using one of the girls to complete his transfer, topping it all off by using the sauna method to destroy Chihiro's handbook, a last measure to ensure the others wouldn't turn it on and out them in the process. The smoking gun that compromises his whole plan, though, is, of course, the manner by which he speaks. A small tell in the Japanese which is replicated somewhat awkwardly in the localization, but which basically boils down to his referential language differing in how he refers to women and men, with it having notably slipped into the opposite camp when talking about Chihiro at the crime scene. On top of that, he briefly recalls the blue color of Chihiro's tracksuit when it's mentioned by Celeste, despite her never actually having said what color it was, something that on top of everything else makes it impossible for him to deny having seen them. Heartbroken, Ishimaru insists that his blood brother could never have done such a horrible deed, but it's that very brother who finally admits his own weakness by conceding defeat, ready to admit how it drove him to murder and how weak he really still is. Facing his execution as Ishimaru begs for his life, Awada apologizes for not being able to keep his promise. He's strapped to a motorcycle that is flung into a round death cage, lit with electricity as he spins rapidly until finally the high speed combined with the high temperature causes his body to liquefy, emerging from a chute in a Mondo Butter branded container of those liquefied remains. With everyone almost conceding to the despair of the sight they just witnessed, it's Kirigiri who cuts in to ask Monokuma the purpose behind such theatrical and elaborate executions, not making sense if they were purely for the sake of disheartening the students themselves. Monokuma cheekily replies that this despair is for all of mankind, but refuses to elaborate any further. A last scene, seemingly taking place after the end of the first trial, reveals to us that not only Monokuma has a spy among the students, but there's also, apparently, a secret 16th student whose identity he refuses to reveal to his spy, due to that being his ace in the hole. This chapter certainly has its positives, but it has quite a few negatives that overall really drag it down for me. On the gameplay side of things, we're introduced here to the mechanics of absorbing certain statements and testimony to act as truth bullets of their own, and admittedly this is one of my least favorite mechanics in the game, because while sometimes it's obvious where to perform it, some instances later throughout the game will get extremely obtuse and difficult to recognize, which is something I really do fault some of these later trials with quite a bit. On the story side of things, I know a lot of people really attach to the bond between Ishimaru and Awada, for instance, and that makes his execution quite the huge emotional sticking point for them. And I'll agree that this element of the story is quite tragic, and handled pretty expertly, but all of the other combined factors I've mentioned already make it difficult for me to really engage with it beyond thinking its mystery elements are an improvement over the first case, otherwise finding it to be very taxing and an arduous case to revisit. This is certainly, for me at least, the low point of the game, having yielded some interesting peaks at what's to come and providing some samples of genuine pathos, but ultimately being one I'm glad to get ahead of and talk about something else. And though the next chapter certainly may not be many people's favorite, it is, if nothing else, definitely a change of pace. The chapter begins with an Asahina cheesecake shot. 
course. Okay, but really. Asahina is depressed because of everything that's happened, evidently, because who wouldn't be? And so she decides to try to find some donuts late at night. Hearing a strange noise from the bathroom, however, she approaches it to find what she thinks, at first, to be the ghost of Chihiro, which she informs everyone about the next day, not before they explore the newly opened third floor though, of course, revealing a rec room, an art room with an accompanying repository, and a physics lab with a large air purifier inside, which we also find a cheap anime-branded camera inside of as well. The nurse's office on the first floor is also open now. Dialing back for a second to the repository though, Naegi makes a pretty shocking discovery in it, a seed for future twists yet to come, in the form of a picture of Iwata, Leon, and Chihiro all together and smiling in a classroom without any plates on the windows. Considering that none of the students are supposed to have met before coming to Hope's Peak, this picture certainly creates a lot of intrigue, the kind that immediately gets your mind racing. When was this taken? Everyone in this photo is definitely dead after all, right? But if they never met before this point, then what could it all mean? All these questions are left tantalizingly open, but frustratingly unanswered, as Monokuma appears to confiscate it, clearly having planted it to intentionally make us wonder about its origins. When reviewing their discussions and lack of discovery of an exit once again, Asahina brings up her encounter with the supposed ghost she saw, prompting everyone to investigate the bathhouse where this supposedly took place. Instead of a ghost, they find a laptop, the one broken in Chapter 2. Turns out that Chihiro fixed it before biting the big one and installed a sort of AI duplicate of himself called Alter Ego, which is currently in the process of trying to decrypt some of the secret files on the laptop in the hope that the information within will help lead to a potential escape. Conversely, the reason the laptop was left in the bathhouse locker was because there are no security cameras in the bathhouse, one of the only places in the school where this is true. Initially thought to be for privacy reasons, but admitted by Monokuma as only because the fog would obscure the lenses anyway. Just as everyone's getting out of the bathhouse though, Monokuma has a special announcement to make before the day's end, not content to sit on his laurels and let too much time pass before he gives another motive. This one's about as simple as they come this time too, being a cash prize of 10 million dollars to whoever takes the plunge into perfect crime. Yet again, the process repeats of characters wondering aloud if anyone would seriously be petty or stupid enough to kill for something as simple as money, and others still lamenting that unless you know another's full circumstances, you have no idea what they'd be willing to kill for. Of course though, Monokuma may be impatient, this game isn't going to play to all of his whims, with there being plenty of free time and further plot turns to take before we get to the big main event of this chapter. For example, Yamada finds himself falling for the AI Chihiro because the program's desire to gather information makes him feel as though for the first time someone genuinely has an interest in what he has to say, something that borders on sweetly sad if not for the fact that he's also predictably creepy about the whole thing. Ishimaru also has a transformative experience with the program, having moped around nearly the entire chapter because of his traumatic response to Awada's death, but gaining a sense of impassioned determination after it approximates what kind of encouragement Awada would give him, were he still alive, leading him to become some strange amalgamation of his own personality traits in Awada's, whereupon he labels himself Ishida. I'll be honest when I say that I personally never took much interest in Ishimaru as a character, despite his surprising popularity among fans. I don't hate him or anything, I just think he's rather unremarkable, and perhaps only truly notable for his grief and this. And to be completely honest, I do actually find Ishida to be bordering on slightly more interesting by this virtue, it's just that he gets very little time to even develop before- oh, uh, well, we're not there yet, but- I'm sure you've already guessed now. Of course, considering these guys both have developed huge attachments to the laptop, it can't go without complication arising, with both of them arguing fiercely over who should lay claim to it. Kirigiri is quick to forbid either of them from touching it, claiming it's for everyone's use as a valuable asset for the escape plan, but this doesn't stop them from trying to sneak around the rules regardless. And of course, sure enough, when you're summoned for a meeting later by Hagakure, it seems as though Alter Ego has gone missing, stolen by someone, and that someone won't fess up. By the next morning, that familiar sense of dread has already started to creep its way back up, and the lack of familiar faces in the dining hall quickly causes that pressure to mount. Fearing the worst, everyone begins to explore for the others, quickly discovering Celeste injured in the rec room. Though far from dead, she warns in an uncharacteristically frightened manner that she was attacked by a strange assailant in a robot costume, who wielded a so-called Justice Hammer 1 and who dragged off Yamada. She even presents a picture of him with the camera you discovered the other day. Running off to find him, the gang discovers him injured in the library, again not dead but certainly doing worse than Celeste, with blood streaming down his face and a larger Justice Hammer 2 at his side. 
Bringing him down to the nurse's office, everyone is quick to split up and look for the masked attacker. Calling for help, Celeste again claims to have spotted him running down the hall, but just as she does, Yamada lets out a cry from down in the nurse's office. Everyone splits up, with Nayagi first returning to the nurse's office with Asahina and Celeste, only to find Yamada dead, a third justice hammer beside him. The body discovery announcement follows, seemingly solidifying this horror, and Nayagi rushes upstairs to inform the others. When he arrives at the physics lab, he discovers the body of Ishimaru in quick succession, a final justice hammer, number four, the apparent weapon that did him in. Though bodies are starting to pile up, Monokuma thankfully assures that more than two murders apiece is against school regulations, purely because it would make the game boring for him. When everyone returns to find Yamada's body, it suddenly disappeared, with Ishimaru's following suit. Eventually, both bodies are rediscovered in the repository, the body discovery announcement strangely setting off yet again. Surprisingly, a barely alive Yamada opens his eyes once he's hit by Asahina's tears, mumbling something about how he's met everyone before coming here, and that the name of his attacker is Yasuhiro. The investigation is now afoot, and this case has a ton of clues to go over, which when combined with its, I'll be honest, rather obvious orchestrator makes it a bit frustrating to sit through because of how bloated it can at times feel. There's clearly a tarpon dolly used to move the bodies, Yamada's glasses were cleaned when rediscovered after being drenched in blood to begin with, a glasses cleaning cloth is found in the trash can of the nurse's office, which also contains blood packs in the freezer, Ishimaru's watch is broken resting on a time earlier than Yamada's body was discovered, blueprints for the robot in handwriting not resembling Hagakure's own are found in his room, and Hagakure himself is found knocked out in the pool locker with the suit on, a suit which coincidentally seems very inflexible and impossible to take off by yourself. Both things that would only hinder a murder plan rather than help it. Like, come on now. I'm sorry, poor Celeste, but I'm really not going to spend much time on the synopsis of this trial for this reason. The lowdown is pretty simple when you think about it for even a few minutes. Celeste tricked Yamada into helping her by saying Ishimaru stole alter ego, when really she stole it herself. She also claims he abused her and took pictures, which pushes Yamada into agreeing to help get revenge and escape together, because she claims if they both commit a murder, maybe they can both go free, which he falls for. They set up the elaborate plan they enact with the fictional robo-justice as a scapegoat for their crimes, someone only they see because aside from the first staged photo they take after drugging Hagakure and slapping him into it, he's completely inactive for the rest of the case. They call Ishimaru in the morning, kill him, stage the photo, leave Hagakure in the locker, fake Yamada's attack and subsequent death, while leading everyone to Ishimaru's corpse and using each sequential hammer to fool them about the order of the killings, with Ishimaru's body discovery announcement disguising the fact that Yamada wasn't dead the first time, and then both bodies are moved to the repository by the still-alive Yamada, who is betrayed there by Celeste, who kills him with a regular hammer that she hastily washes down. It turns out then that the reason Yamada claimed he was killed by Yasuhiro in his final moments is because everyone was correct to assume a Japanese girl would not be named Celestia Ludenberg, whose birth name is in fact Taiko Yasuhiro. Having had her crimes exposed, she admits that her motives were related to the life of excess she always dreamed of living, a giant mansion with tons of pretty boy butlers dressed as vampires that could serve her all day long. Apparently, her gambling winnings got her very close to achieving this, but Monokuma's offering of 10 million would certainly put her over the threshold. This, in addition to the fact that she's always lying about her willingness to adapt to this isolative lifestyle, drove her to try to escape into a world where she could recognize her dream, willing to take a couple of bodies down with her in the process if she had to. A lot of people would suggest Celeste's motivation is one of the most shallow in the series, and while I can certainly agree to that to an extent, I also can't help but feel that she's definitely hiding a bit more about herself than she lets on here, and it's not just because I've got a soft spot for her. You see, Celeste is one of the few characters I, predictably, set aside my free time events for in this playthrough, and though she doesn't tell you much about herself, it's clear that she's somebody who values a sense of extravagance and uniqueness of identity that drives her to set herself apart from the rest of the pack. She vehemently refuses any notion of having any real name aside from Celestia Ludenberg, and the only time she even mentions her parents is to lie about who they are, making them out to be much more notable and noteworthy than they're likely to be. One of the few things she deigns to be honest with you about is that she was born in the capital of Tochigi Prefecture, a city called Utsunomiya. There, she admits she came to love gyoza, her self-proclaimed favorite food. In other words, Celeste wants to be seen as a very high-class, untouchable individual whose reputation precedes a long list of accomplishments and extravagant personal details. But in reality, she was a girl born to a working-class family who just loved a bit of good food. When she wasn't out gambling, her obsession with European royalty and Lolita fashion was an attempt to appear more glamorous, to escape her supposedly boring life and self by losing herself in it. 
These aren't the behaviors of someone who likes themselves, despite the way Celeste often talks herself up. And this attempt at bolstering herself, despite the fact that she very likely would have been cared for by her friends for who she really was, even if she wasn't as high society as she claimed, is ultimately, unfortunately, something that's indicative of how truly little she regarded herself at all. Combined with her tendency to throw herself into dangerous situations for the thrill of possible victory, I think it's clearer than anything that she was desperate for some kind of adoration or validation from the people around her, and it's in so viciously seeking that in ways that could only serve to hurt her, rather than help, that left her vulnerable to the very vices that commandeered her descent into murder in the first place. Case 3 may not be my favorite mystery, but I certainly don't find its perpetrator uninteresting, not by a long shot. In fact, despite how selfish she seems on the surface, I feel pretty sorry for her, something that any good Danganronpa culprit is bound to provoke from you in one way or another. Though she acts rather relaxed about this whole affair once she can't deny it any longer, Naegi's quick to note her shift of demeanor in this instance, something I definitely felt was made more heavy in my personal playthrough by having done all of her free time events. Not only did she decide Naegi had the potential to become closer to her while they got to know one another, but he was able to effectively expose her lies for the first time ever in her long career of telling them. And in that moment, vulnerably human in her acknowledgement of her own personal mistakes, in front of the first friend she's ever cared to make, her facade slips just enough for him to see the cracks. Celeste smiled then, he says. And when she did, it looked to me like a poor effort to force it. She claimed she could fool her own feelings, but that statement itself must have been her final lie. At that weak, fake smile, is what betrayed her. Before she marches willingly to her punishment, she gives a locker key to Kirigiri, evidently where she hid alter ego in plain sight, remarking, Will it really give you the hope you're looking for? I can't say I ever saw it that way. Which is why, actually, it's not important. Well then, take care everyone. Perhaps we'll meet again, in another life. Tied to the stake to burn, she seems at least content with the prospect of a fittingly extravagant death, something that could match the kind of bombast she'd always craved to be known for. But just as she thinks death could perhaps offer her what had always escaped her in life, Monokuma adds a drop of cruel irony to round out his punishment, a fire truck suddenly appearing to crash into the stage, killing her by way of one of the most common, boring methods of death that someone could ever think to experience. A banal tragedy, the kind that's so unremarkable you hardly even hear about it in the news. So quietly ends the life of Taiko Yasuhiro. Before the chapter can wrap, we get a few more sudden twists to tease us for what's to come. Alter Ego is found safe and sound in the locker that Celeste handed out the key for, and Kirigiri tells Nayagi of a secret room that's apparently hidden in the second floor boy's bathroom, one of few other rooms without security cameras. Discovering it for himself, he finds many files in a desk, one being a student registry and another mysterious paper reading you must not leave. Struck with a sudden and strange feeling of deja vu, Nayagi is accosted by a mask-wearing perpetrator holding a pipe, who clocks him out cold and leaves him to awaken with all of the room's contents hastily removed later. After leaving to head to bed, he notices strange noises coming from the gym and peeks inside to see Sakura and Monokuma fighting, the former of which claiming that she will no longer work as his spy, and instead only work to resist him. The mole's identity is revealed, three more people are down for the count, and things are set only to get crazier from here. Chapter 3 is a bit of a doozy in discussion. While I have no real inherent issues with its subject matter like in Chapter 2, I do have plenty of obvious issues with its overall structure and pacing. It suffers from a common issue in a lot of these types of games, where the middle case is usually the one that feels most like filler when compared to the rest. And though it does have plot elements of its own, they're certainly not things that feel as if they could only work in this story. The motive is admittedly a bit less fleshed out than many other crimes in the series, and the process of the discovery and investigation portions is very drawn out and bloated with evidence, which only makes this inevitable slog through the class trial feel that much more unexciting, considering that all of this misdirection and pages worth of evidence to comb through are in service to one of the most honestly easily deduced culprits in the game. No hate to Celeste herself, but as a player, even when first reading DR, I was never that surprised when she turned out to be the killer, because her behavior is extremely suspicious from the very start. Even if you didn't instantly figure out she was the killer by how she was acting, the fact that she was the only one of Robo Justice's supposed attack victims left alive by the end should have sealed it right then and there. 
Almost the entire game up to this point, she's highly unsociable and practically ghosts the class when she's not declaring how they'll likely die from an inability to adapt, and now she's suddenly a distressed damsel who would prostrate herself before a cosplaying attacker and who will willfully, fearfully relay her anxieties to her peers? Yeah, give me a break. It's not the worst case in a mystery game or anything, don't get me wrong, and as I've outlined here already, there are elements about it to be enjoyed, but the miserable pacing combined with the incredibly obvious solution made this one in particular feel like much more of a foregone conclusion by the time the trial was reached, and that does no favors towards making it feel as exciting or compelling as other, better cases in the franchise. Thankfully though, as far as this entry is concerned, the experience is only uphill from here in my opinion. <laughs> After starting the chapter with a brief recap of the body count so far, we quickly cut back to our current gang, with Nayagi reluctant to disclose what he saw with Sakura the previous day, before he knows more about the situation. Unfortunately, it seems his secrecy is not at all appreciated by Kirigiri, who takes it as an offense and betrayal of his character up until this point, perhaps bringing out the side of her that is reluctant to trust other people. I have to say it's genuinely kind of upsetting to feel like you're on bad terms with her after working so closely with her thus far. It kind of makes you feel like you really stepped over some kind of line or something. Something, even though as a player you know that not rushing to announce Sakura's secret is probably the better idea. Seeing as there's been a trial though, of course, that means a new floor is open, which means new things to explore. Heading to the fourth floor, you discover a headmaster's office, which is locked, a data center, which is also locked, a chem lab with a variety of proteins and poisons within its many shelves, a music room, which resembles a small concert hall, and an office, which contains yet another strange photograph, this time of Mizuno, Celeste, and Yamada all hanging out together, seemingly enjoying themselves as there are, once again, no metal plates in sight on the windows in the background. Monokuma provides very little help in discerning what exactly is with said photo, just as with last time, but he does emphasize that the photo is completely real, even if he doesn't explain how or why that is. By the time everyone reports their findings, there's still no sign of an exit, of course. However, the two locked doors do seem to be of big note, enough so, in fact, for Hagakure to suggest breaking them down. Seemingly nervous about the prospect, Monokuma hastily appears to add a rule against breaking down locked doors in the school, which, while it seemingly prevents them from being able to do so, at least clarifies something very important. That being that there's definitely something important enough behind those doors to warrant Monokuma doing something like that. Returning to the bathhouse to check up on Alter Ego, it seems they've decrypted the files on the laptop as requested, and unearthed plans outlining a lifetime communal stay for the students within Hope's Peak Academy by the school's actual administration, seemingly thought up by the actual headmaster himself. Naturally confused as to why they would do such a thing, Alter Ego responds that it appears to have been done in response to something called, quote, the worst, most despair-inducing incident in the history of mankind. Apparently, whatever event this was happened at least a year ago, forcing the school to cease its operations and sequester its students for some purpose yet unknown. Alter Ego suggests that the headmaster is likely still somewhere in the school and may perhaps be the mastermind himself, however Kirigiri seems strangely insistent that this isn't the case, her reasons left ambiguous for now. With Alter Ego's job seemingly done, the laptop sadly puts itself into rest mode, with everyone reflecting on just how much of a person an AI could be thought as, considering its algorithm for learning is not unlike that of an actual human brain. In doing so, they all begin to start considering the possibility of Alter Ego, in some fashion, being just as much their friend as anyone else, and this thought lingers when considering what they might be able to do for the program from there on. With a day of free time ahead of you, Naegi tries his best to reach out to Sakura about what he saw, but finds himself unable to get a word in yet. Nervous about both the information he knows and the friction between himself and Kirigiri, he's caught off guard when everyone is once again summoned by Monokuma to the gym. Claiming that he merely has a grudge to air out rather than a motive to give, he announces nearly without incident that Sakura was his spy in the group, though of course this is obviously meant to spark unease and infighting within the group, which it definitely does. Togami, Fukawa, and Hagakure don't trust Sakura at all, with Asahina taking much offense to the way they treat her, especially considering that she clarifies she was only ever instructed to kill to kickstart things, having never done so before Mizuno could unexpectedly kick things off, and the whole reason for this was because her family dojo was being held hostage by the mastermind. Of course, the already skeptical have very little reason to believe her, and Togami's particular dismissals of whether or not it would be bad for her to die because of this earns him a slap to the face from Asahina, something I suspect many players will have wanted to deliver to him themselves before this point. Storming off to her room to see, the Asahina leaves, and Kirigiri remarks to Togami that all he can seemingly do in response to other people's feelings is mock them for it, an observation he seems none too bothered by, but which she clarifies will almost certainly come back to bite him one day. 
The next day, the tension has only racked up even further, with Asahina's anger leading her to squabble with Fukawa next, who ends up sneezing and switching out with Sho, who quickly defends herself by cutting Asahina with her scissors. Though she isn't dead, of course, this injury makes it necessary to haul her to the nurse's office right away, upon which Sakura is infuriated to learn that this has happened, blaming her own weakness and conceding to the mastermind's pressure for her own friend getting hurt, something she finds inexcusable when finding only herself at fault in the situation. For what it's worth though, despite how dire the situation has seemingly grown, Kirigiri pulls you aside to admit that she now understands your reluctance in discussing Sakura's fight with Monokuma, saying that it was probably the smartest course of action to hang back and refrain from discussing such inflammatory topics without more information. She admits to overreacting, with a hint of blush on her features in the meanwhile. It seems you've both finally made up, even if she remains as characteristically withdrawn as ever. This moment of cute levity can, of course, only last so long, though, as we've got places to go. Namely, to Alter Ego, who has requested Kirigiri and Naegi's help specifically with something. That something being taking a risk and finding a place to connect them to the school's network. Not wanting to remain on the sidelines and instead wanting to help their friends, both agree to honor Alter Ego's request after some hesitation, deciding to plug them up to the network port in the hidden room that Naegi was previously attacked in, which I should note he did mention to Kirigiri earlier, by the way. Don't worry, he didn't miss that bit. Hoping that this will lead to some kind of clue being further unearthed, Naegi returns to his room to nap, only to be rudely awakened by the doorbell later on in the day. Kirigiri informs you that Asahina has called everyone to the rec room, and once you arrive, the reason becomes fairly obvious. Sakura is unmoving inside, and the door appears to be stuck, with Kirigiri clarifying that the door can't be locked due to lacking a lock mechanism in the first place. Everyone decides that breaking it shouldn't violate school regulations, and break the window to force their way in. Rushing to Sakura's side, Naegi claps his hand onto her shoulder, but it's too late. She's gone. Sitting in a pose oddly reminiscent of the final panel of Ashita no Jo, no less, doubtlessly an intentional reference considering both characters' similar professions. There's no time for manga trivia here, though, because as the body discovery announcement is quick to remind us, we're going to have a class trial soon. And despite everyone's shock, especially Asahina's, we don't have time to slow down and mourn for even a second, or else plenty more bodies are going to pile up as a result. With the horrible taste of defeat in your mouth, knowing that things escalated to this point despite your best efforts, you begin your investigation. Asahina runs to retrieve everyone, and already things are starting to look a bit obviously weird. It seems, according to her, all three of the others, Togami, Fukawa, and Hagakure, were invited to the rec room by Sakura for a talk earlier. All of them claim not to have gone, but details around the scene suggest otherwise. The Monokuma file describes head wounds that Sakura received, but also notes that she vomited blood, something visible on the corpse, and unlikely to have been only from blunt force trauma, especially considering Kirigiri's elaboration that no cuts exist inside of her mouth. Of course, there's also the matter of this being a locked room, which means there must have been some way the perpetrator was able to get out or mix into the crowd after the fact, something that is much easier said than done. Clues from this point include a polka-dotted candy wrapper on the floor, which Asahina apparently gave to Sakura from her own personal candy stash, a broken Monokuma bottle behind her which seems to weigh more than another unbroken bottle, a handprint on the inside of the rec room's locker door, a blood stain in front of the magazine rack, a magazine placed upside down inside of it with a bloody message bearing Fukawa's name, and a bottle of protein drink laying amidst and on top of some of the broken window glass. And that's just all in the rec room. In the chem lab, there's more, a large spill of yellow powder on the floor with footprints hastily made in front of the first cabinet, containing mostly proteins but also one bottle of poison from the far right section, containing more of the same. Sakura herself also seemingly has some of this yellow powder on the inset of her shoe, upon second check. And of course, lastly, upon asking both Fukawa and Hagakure if they went to the rec room as they were instructed, both seem to be unconvincing in their denials of doing so, and Hagakure even drops a similar candy wrapper to the one found at the crime scene, hastily stuffing it back into his pocket. With your assortment of clues at the ready, it's time to head into the class trial. And I am already so relieved at how much less bloated this case is, while remaining suitably curious nonetheless. I know DR1 like the back of my hand these days, so I don't know what the general consensus on the quality of this mystery is, but I feel like there's a lot of clear elements of misdirection here playing on common mystery tropes to achieve this effect, and I think it's handled quite well, as I remember being very shocked by the conclusion upon first reaching it. But of course, before we can reach that conclusion, we gotta have our debate, starting with the most obvious liar in the room, Hagakure. It takes very little effort to expose through the unique candy wrapper that he did go to the scene, and though he defends himself by mentioning the supposed dying message in the magazine that implicates Fukawa, Kirigiri points out that it was inside the room on the magazine rack during the investigation, and that with Asahina fiercely guarding the crime scene, he would have had no way of seeing it after the fact. 
Still arguing that she must have written it, you knock some reality back into Hagakure when you're quick to point out there was no blood on her hands, suggesting no opportunity to write with said blood. Only about 10 minutes into this nearly hour and a half long trial, Hagakure confesses to the murder, so naturally it's not about to be as simple as he describes. Still, he does sincerely think he killed her, despite being so incompetent about hiding it. Having apparently gone to meet with her, gotten scared at her mumbling to herself, and assumed she was out to get him, whereupon he then took a Monokuma bottle in hand while her back was turned and smashed it over her head, quickly using some of the blood to implicate Fukawa in an open magazine on the table. He scrambled, but this doesn't explain several things I'm sure you noticed. The discussion then turns to Fukawa herself, as given that the magazine was hidden, it would only benefit the person blamed within its pages to do so. Though she initially denies being present, the second head wound that Sakura is sporting proves that she was clocked by someone other than Hagakure, which leads us to finding out another sequence of unfortunate events. Namely, it's that Fukawa arrived early, afraid to confront Sakura, and hid in the room's locker. Witnessing the first attack and subsequent attempt at framing, she emerged after Hagakure's exit and hid the magazine on the rack, putting it in upside down in her haste. Only after this, Sakura was still not dead and approached Fukawa with blood still on her face, causing her to freak out and lose consciousness, immediately giving way to a switch in front with Sho, who acted defensively and smacked Sakura with another Monokuma bottle, creating the blood stain in front of the magazine rack. Truly believing herself to have killed the other, she went about disposing of the evidence by trying to sweep up some of the bottle shards and its accompanying chess piece, but was unsure how much to take because of Hagakure's bottle already being scattered on the floor, leading to too many being left behind and ultimately weighing more than just a single bottle would. Having fled the scene afterward though, the locked room, the chem lab evidence, and Sakura's body being discovered in the chair with blood on her mouth is still not explained. So what do we discuss now? Well, of course, the possibility of poisoning, as Togami is quick to note the scattering of powder discovered in the chem lab. Having realized both the protein and poison were stored within, he hypothesizes that somebody could have switched Sakura's protein drink with poison and tricked her into consuming it, thus leading to her death, and proves they were switched by just straight up taking a swig of the bottle of poison that he found in the wrong cabinet. But thankfully for him, he's right, with just the protein being left inside, lending credence to his theory. With all this in mind, combined with the sneakered footprints in front of the cabinet, it's concluded that Asahina must have actually been the culprit, having seen her chance to get an easy kill when her injured friend asked for her usual protein drink, taking advantage of that trust to poison her. Of course, while Togami can absolutely imagine this with his cynical outlook on things, Naegi isn't so sure, and Asahina's sudden insistence that she is indeed the culprit seems, yet again, wrong. First of all, Asahina still can't explain how the locked room was created, which throws her claim into serious suspicion. And second of all, a shard of the window's glass seems to have been at the bottom of the poison bottle filled with protein, which is very strange considering the poison bottle was supposedly only in the chem lab at the time of the substances being swapped and was never supposed to have left it. From here, Asahina's story breaks down, her account of switching materials between cabinets not holding up with her footprints only settling in front of the first. And it seems for the first time, Togami is actually pretty flustered about his last of knowledge on what's happening here. So what is the deal here? Well, remember the powder on Sakura's foot? Yep, it turns out she's the one who initially took the poison, and the poison alone, no protein. Unable to imagine under which circumstances she would willingly drink from the poison bottle knowing what it was, Togami balks and we've gotta spell it out for him. Sakura wasn't killed by Hagakure, or Fukawa, or even Asahina. It was all her own actions. As reluctant as Asahina is to admit it, the sequence of events only makes sense this way, and it seems Togami's lack of emotional understanding, as pointed out to him by Kirigiri earlier, really has come back to bite him. Turns out, Sakura first invited everyone to talk, but was of course attacked, as we saw. It was at this point that she went to the chem lab and retrieved the poison, creating the mess that got her shoe dirty in the process. Bringing it back to the rec room, she was discovered by a terrified Asahina, whom she asked to get her a protein drink for her wounds so that she could distract her from what she was about to do. Asahina agreed, running to the chem lab to get what she asked for, but upon arriving and seeing the mess, realized what was happening, rushing back. Upon returning, she discovered that Sakura had blocked the door, sat down in her chair, and drank the poison, leaving her dead and the room locked off. Allowing everyone to break into the room, Asahina used the commotion to swipe the poison bottle near the doorway from the ground and bring it back to the chem lab, going only to the cabinet with the proteins to perform the swap and make it look like an intentional homicide, creating her footprint trail as she came back to the room with the others and placed the protein drink bottle down, neglecting to notice both that it was laying on top of some of the glass, which it couldn't have been if it was there before the window was broken, 
and that the poison bottle still had shards of the window's glass inside of it because it was actually laying there. With nowhere left to turn, Asahina confesses to her subterfuge, admitting that she tried to mislead everyone to their deaths because of a suicide note she found from Sakura detailing her despair at her own situation, and how much she was hated. Believing that they all drove Sakura into a corner and led her to her own death, she believed the only appropriate course of action was to get them all punished to atone for what they were all supposedly mutually responsible for. Of course, this wouldn't be Danganronpa without that cruel twist of irony, would it? Nope, which means that of course this note was faked by Monokuma to rile Asahina into doing just this and making the case more interesting. The real note left by Sakura, only revealed now, details instead that Sakura's motivations were not born out of sadness, but actually love for her friends. Seeing the way the mastermind intended to create disruption in their numbers with her exposure, she only blames herself for her weakness in bending to their will. Originally, as said before, she was instructed to start the killings, but was left unable to do so when Mizuno unexpectedly made the first move. From there, she was instructed to hold back, only getting involved once the killing had reached another stalemate. But over time of getting to know everyone, especially Asahina herself, Sakura began to find herself very fond of all of her friends, and ashamed of the fear that controlled her into accepting the mastermind's orders. With the seeds of distrust sown by her betrayal being exposed, and seeing the way it was only leading to her friends being harmed, like the mastermind wanted, Sakura decided to solve the issue the only way she knew how, taking a life just as she was instructed, but taking her own, in an attempt to finally broker peace between the students who had so far fell into despair again and again. When I die, the source of conflict among you all dies with me, she wrote. For that, I'm willing to give up my life. If it can save you, then sacrificing my own life could have no greater meaning. Whatever you think of me, please know that you are all my most treasured friends. I've never had people like you in my life. Finally realizing Sakura's intentions, Asahina is horrified by what she was nearly tricked by Monokuma into doing, and Kirigiri adds her own two cents in a line that really just gut punches me even harder amongst all of this. She didn't end her own life because she was weak. Quite the opposite, in fact. She was strong. Too strong. That's why she killed herself. She chose death for herself in order to protect the rest of us. To sacrifice so much, no normal person could do that. It was only her limitless strength that made it possible. Ending her message by pleading with Asahina to survive along with the others, Sakura's life was brought to a close shortly after. Monokuma claims that because the group still ended up fighting and almost dying as a result of her death, that her choice of sacrifice was entirely meaningless. But finally, in a moment of catharsis that has been a long time coming for the story so far, he's brought down a peg. His outright manipulation is called for what it is, and it's made clear that Sakura's gesture is not lost on the group. No longer blaming her for anything, all of the holdovers realize her strength too, and Togami himself refuses to participate in the killing game any longer, only dedicated to working together with everyone else to discover the mastermind's true identity. None of the main characters from this point onward die, and Sakura's sacrifice is thus solidified as meaningfully impactful. What she set out to do, she succeeded at even if it was at the cost of her own life. Of course, not content to let the group's new determination be the highlight of the night, Monokuma explains that he's got a special guest lined up for punishment since this case's victim and killer were one and the same. Wondering who it could possibly be, considering the circumstances, you wait with anxious and bated breath to see who ends up at the beginning of the execution and... Oh. Oh god. Oh, no, dude, no! Yeah, he found Alter Ego, and he wastes no time in using a bulldozer to crush them into a million tiny pieces, reconstructed as a little ball of compost with Monokuma's visage plastered atop. This is such a punch in the gut, though in retrospect it's not as surprising to me as it was on first glance. I mean, they weren't exactly subtle about the whole bathhouse rendezvous before, and connecting the laptop to the network was almost surely going to get them caught. Heck, Monokuma himself even admits that he knew they were in possession of the laptop and that Chihiro had messed with it somehow the entire time, and was willing to let their sneakiness slide as a reward for their clever thinking. He only gets it in his mind that the poor thing needs to be old yellered when they connect it to the network, which is skating just a bit too close to confidence for his liking, which led to this. Disheartened and angered by the loss of another friend, everyone steals their resolves, at least confident that they can stick together now that they've been properly galvanized to do so. Before the chapter ends, Monokuma notes a last PS in Sakura's note that the mastermind has done something to everyone's bodies, but he refuses to read on and divulge for fear of spoilers, also noting that she said something about fighting him, which he doesn't understand the meaning of quite yet. 
In the dead of night, Nagi is awoken by Kirigiri, who enters his unlocked room while he's asleep and drags him out to find out what Sakura's final words meant. She tells him to meet her at the data center, but he's surprised to see nobody is there when he arrives. Instead, he provokes Monokuma into a discussion, which we quickly realized must be a distraction for him, while Kirigiri searches on her own. Returning while pretending nothing is amiss, they head back to the dorms, upon which Kirigiri reveals to Naegi that the 16th student hiding somewhere in the school is somebody by the name of Mukuro Ikusaba, the apparent super high school level despair, and to watch out for her. Thus ending chapter 4. This chapter is a whole lot better, I have to say. We've returned to form with both an extremely emotional case and one that has a lot of thought put into its structure. The discussion still lasts decently long, with plenty of twists and turns along the way, but the evidence list and sequence of events is much more truncated, leading it to feel more concise than Case 3 did, while still remaining suitably difficult to guess until you get closer to the very end. Sakura was a much less immediately obvious culprit than Celeste was, that's for sure, and though I'm not sure I'd say she was more secretive than, say, Iwata, I still think there's plenty of misdirection here that makes the case flow very well. I mean, especially because all of the killings thus far have been murders, too, which means the possibility of suicide just hasn't really come up, and thus the player's pattern of recognition is thrown off course, making this an even more startling revelation once you start approaching the discussion's end. The motivations for Asahina's subterfuge were fittingly sad, and Monokuma's cruelty in tricking her really goes a long way in displaying how nasty he is, while also highlighting some of the cracks in his decidedly cynical worldview, having been necessary to compel Asahina's anger with a much more depressing fake note, rather than simply being a matter of her own human nature leading her into it and nothing else. The small reveals of what's to come, as usual, plant interesting seeds for the ongoing questions we've had until now, and of course, as bad as everyone was at hiding alter ego, their death is still a huge punch in the stomach to witness. Chapter 4 isn't my favorite chapter in the entire game or anything, but it's a marked step up from some of my differing complaints from the last few, and overall I would say it's a very cohesive and compelling chapter that I have basically no gripes with at all. An excellent note to lead us on into the latter act of the story. Chapter 5 is a curious one. It's unlike any other chapter in the game, really, as while the following chapter will certainly condense on its format for the sake of being a proper, punchy climax, this one adheres to a more familiar structure, but still manages to be distinctly different. This is the lead up to the climax, basically, a preparatory round that will set up a lot of the important things about the finale that we'll need to consider going forward. But it also works to throw us off massively from the established rhythm we've faced until now, emphasizing that sense of mounting uncertainty and a feeling that we've really headed into uncharted territory for the first time in several chapters. It starts off, unlike any other, with a flash forward to the body that we'll be finding, which appears to be the mysterious masked figure that attacked Naegi back at the end of Chapter 3. Flashing back, we begin our search of the final floor of the school, Floor 5. This floor is the most esoteric yet, when compared to the more traditional aspects of the others, beginning to resemble an academic institution less and less, and showing off floor plans and rooms that really emphasize the somewhat alien and uncomfortable feeling of being trapped in a place like this. It's incredible how even this many hours deep, the environment of Hope's Peak Academy can create such unique dread about itself, despite ostensibly being much less claustrophobic than it started out. This is, of course, not helped at all by one of the classrooms you discover, the only one in the game that looks any different than a mere copy-paste of the other classrooms littering the halls. This one is an absolute train wreck of a scene, with signs of struggling everywhere, desks and chairs strewn violently about, and chalk outlines of misshapen forms scattering the floor as the entire room is drenched in walls and waves of dried, putrid blood. It's also the only blood in the game that appears red, highly reminiscent of a piece of promotional artwork from the original Distrust, which fits the way Monokuma speaks about it when asked. I just left it exactly how I found it. Of course, within the context of this game, and not a cancelled one, one can only assume what terrible things occurred here, and this shock to the system transforms the lavish and lurid fixtures of the floor, making it feel like a place you never want to be for too long, simply because it shares space with this room. Even just knowing it inhabits the academy at all instantly reinforms us about the sense of terror and isolation this situation should always provoke in those trapped here. Of course, this isn't the only place we have to check. We've also got a dojo complete with lockers and a targeting practice station, a greenhouse with tons of overgrown vegetation, a sprinkler system, chickens, and a shed of many tools, including a mysterious pickaxe with Awada's insignia, Crazy Diamond, on it. Yes, I know it's a JoJo reference, all right, are you happy? And a bio lab, which is blocked off from access. When everyone gathers to discuss what they've found, Fukawa expresses her discomfort around a knife she found laying around in a classroom, and everyone votes to have Naegi hold on to it. In addition, Togami casts his long-standing suspicions on Kirigiri over her never revealing her talent, to which she responds that she has no memory of it. 
Not believing her, Togami demands she either talk or forfeit her room key, to which she responds by handing over the key, infuriating him for seemingly being so stubborn. Just as she's leaving, Monokuma appears to interrogate everyone about something of his that's apparently been stolen, but seeing as no one knows what he's referring to, he skulks off, pissed about it, but unable to deduce who he should be going after. Returning to his room, Nayagi is once again visited by Kirigiri, who calls him to the bathhouse to discuss something privately. Apparently, the precious item stolen from Monokuma was her doing, obviously, and she found it in the headmaster's room on the fourth floor. Turns out, Sakura's way of deciding to fight the mastermind was by breaking the rules by breaking its lock before she killed herself, leaving everyone else able to access it. This meant that while Nayagi was distracting Monokuma the other night, she snuck in to search around, discovering both a student profile for Mukuro Ikusaba and the item she stole, which was a Monokuma key that can unlock every area in the school. All of this in preparation for what Kirigiri believes will soon be an opportunity to thwart and unmask the mastermind. Wondering if when a moment of crisis arrives, they will break their own rules or adhere to them no matter the cost. Giving Naegi a note that she explains he should only open if something happens to her, she departs for the night, leaving you back in your dorm room with a lot of questions. By the time morning comes, it seems Monokuma can't find Kirigiri at all, which means she likely used the key to sneak off to an unknown area of the school while you were humoring him the night prior. Though this leaves you with a day of free time, it's one punctuated rudely by Naegi falling into a bout of fever, where he falls prone into bed a bit earlier than usual. During his strange half-haze, half-sleep, he hears his own voice talking about how for the sake of hope he has to stay at the academy. Jolted awake by this strange premonition, he sees the masked figure from the hidden room standing above his bed with the confiscated knife, and though he's under the impression that he flew into defense, everything is so scrambled that he can't quite remember, only able to make out a sight of Kirigiri in his room without the attacker once things have seemingly passed. When morning comes, he checks the drawer he left the knife in, and sure enough, it's nowhere to be found. Considering the sight we saw earlier in the chapter's beginning, this is starting to prove troubling. Going to the regular breakfast meeting, Naegi is surprised to learn that everyone has stayed up all night trying to get in touch with him earlier, but unable due to his fever sleep. They're all gathered in the gym, and for a less than expected reason. Apparently, while passing through earlier, they noticed Monokuma standing idly and responding to nothing at all. Apparently, it seemed as if whoever was at his reins just stopped, and their suspicions were confirmed when, seeing an opportunity, they began to dismantle the bear to see what makes him tick. Though they find one of the many bombs each Monokuma model is outfitted with, they find little else aside from the knowledge that he's a very sophisticated piece of technology, and again, this lingering sense that something must be wrong if he was totally inactive. Deciding to head upstairs and force their way into the previously inaccessible fourth floor rooms, due to the mastermind's apparent absence, they prepare to grab a pickaxe from the greenhouse to get hacking at doors, when Fukawa, who was sent after it, suddenly returns as genocide or show, meaning she must have fainted for a reason we all probably suspect already. Yep, turns Turns out she fainted at the sight of blood and informs everyone of a mysterious corpse laying in the greenhouse itself. The mysterious corpse, covered with a white coat and evidently stabbed through the chest with the stolen knife from Nayagi, is laying there unmoving, undoubtedly dead. Everyone begins to suspect that this, combined with the mysterious behavior of Monokuma, may point to the mastermind being dead, and they rush to unveil the figure's masked face. Before they can, though, the body just up and explodes, leaving the familiar bomb fragments behind, but most importantly making it nearly impossible to identify the corpse's features, leaving behind only the knife, some fake nails, and exposing a strange wolf tattoo on the corpse's right hand. Laying nearby is also what appears to be a key to the data center, which everyone uses to get into it. Seeing that it seems to be a hub for the security cameras, everyone again extrapolates that the body must have been Mukuro Ikusaba, and that she must have been the mastermind. While poking around the mastermind's personal security, security room, they also find a TV with a wireless antenna, which seems to be a potential connection to information about the outside world. When they get it working, however, we get yet another huge few bomb drops. First of all, all the antenna is showing on every channel is the security feed of everyone standing in the data center. Second of all, Monokuma suddenly appears, cackling at everyone for assuming he was dead, and clarifying that the mastermind is very much alive and well, having pretended to be out of commission for a while just to get your hopes up and then squash them in the palm of his paw. An incredibly effective fake out, especially to those playing this game back in the day, who had no way of knowing that Monokuma would be a returning adversary in future games. And thirdly, he elaborates that the camera feed is seemingly being picked up from the airwaves because this killing game is actually being broadcast to the entire world, shaking the very foundation of what we understand about this story's world so far, as the implication behind that statement is astronomical resources, the like of which we couldn't possibly imagine a single criminal being capable of. When I say this goofy cartoon teddy bear can really strike fear into you, I mean he absolutely can. 
With very little space to continue reeling, Monokuma gets back on his trademark BS to announce a body discovery a little bit late, confirming that yes indeed, the mysterious garden body will be having a trial, and one of the students is responsible for killing it. That means it's evidence gathering time. Oh boy, get ready, this list is a little bit long. The knife that was the apparent murder weapon, the status of the body, the wolf tattoo, the dirty tarp in the shed, the bomb fragments, the alibis of the others, and the lack of one for you and Kirigiri. The one less chicken in the coop than before, the sprinkler system always set to go off at 7.30, a locker key to a dojo locker in Kirigiri's room, a student registry file from Mukuro Ikusaba under Kirigiri's sheets, Monokuma's testimony that Kirigiri wears gloves to cover burn scars, meaning the body can't be hers, a bundle of titanium arrows in the dojo locker, a wad of duct tape below it with blood on it, and finally, information on the military group Fenrir, which Mukuro apparently belonged to, which indicates that they all get wolf tattoos signifying Fenrir somewhere on their body. All of this evidence points to the body being Mukuro's, needless to say, and it seems some evidence is very conveniently placed in the interest of pinning this all on Kirigiri, who thankfully shows up right before the trial to convey to you that yeah, she's both okay and was running a little bit late because she was exploring the second floor of the dorms with her special stolen key, a place which had no surveillance and thus no way of hearing Monokuma's announcements in. She took her time getting to the trial elevator specifically because she had to quickly backtrack and catch herself up on all the details of the crime. As you head down to the courtroom, things are more uncertain than ever. Something about the whole way these past few days have gone, and especially the process of this crime, its victim and its rush to trial, seems extremely suspicious. And without really feeling ready at all to explain everything going on, you step into debate once again, hoping that somewhere along the way you'll be able to find some sort of explanation for what's just happened. Of course, as you might expect, this goes disastrously. There's just not enough information. You're able to safely conclude that the body is Mukuro Ikusaba's, but not really on the who killed her part. You're able to sort of argue that you couldn't have done it because of the time you were verifiably awake and when the body was discovered, leaving a specific time frame it would have had to been placed there due to the sprinklers being likely to get it wet otherwise. But this is totally pulled back by Kirigiri, who is also desperate to prove she's innocent, mentioning that the tarp could have very easily made it possible to prevent this and that the blood on the jacket was clearly a chicken's that was added afterward to make the knife wound appear consistent with the state of the body and further establish this sort of false alibi. Of course, there's also the fact that Naegi had the knife found stabbed into her, which certainly doesn't do him any favors in this respect either. Of course, the stab wound doesn't appear to have killed her anyway, considering the fake blood, which loops us back around to discussing the damage to her head, apparently inflicted by the duct-taped bundle of arrows found in that dojo locker whose key was in Kirigiri's room. This all comes down to a defense from Kirigiri where she claims that without her room key that she gave to Togami, she couldn't have stored away the dojo key and used the bundle of arrows to bludgeon Mukuro with. Of course, knowing the secret she told you about the special Monokuma key, you know this is a lie, and you're actually given the opportunity to call her out on it. If you do, though, you've fallen into the Mastermind's trap. Just as you didn't want to needlessly mention Sakura's betrayal before it was time, this was supposed to be a test of your self-proclaimed trust in Kirigiri. And if you fail to return the favor, you've backed her into a corner she can't escape, one Monokuma set up intentionally for her. Sentenced to her death, this leads you to the bad ending of the game, where everyone decides to just give up, Monokuma stops giving motives, and they all grow up trapped in the school and having weird babies. It's kind of an interesting turn that, in this game all about seeking the truth, going with your player's instinct above the choice Naegi would think to make on an emotional level leads you to the worst outcome. The truth does not always lead to what's happiest or what's best for everyone else. It was Naegi who understood this earlier when he intentionally hid Sakura's secret from the others until he felt like he could get a proper grasp of the situation. By forcing this information out of Kirigiri before she's ready to share it, you've effectively done the exact thing she admits she was wrong to do to you a chapter ago. Of course, that doesn't make the other choice less horrifying either, at least at first, because ignoring Kirigiri's lie still ends up pinning the blame squarely on your shoulders. And without the proper evidence to shake this implication, everyone votes for you. Knowing as a player you didn't commit the crime, this is horrifying because it either means Monokuma's about to pull some BS and kill you, or he's going to acknowledge that everyone was wrong and kill all of you. The former is what he chooses, of course, with Kirigiri realizing in dread and regret that this trap was twofold, capable of either taking her or you out, as both have served as inconveniences to the Mastermind, and that her bet about whether the Mastermind would break their own rules in a moment of crisis seems unfortunately to have been answered with a resounding yes. Thankfully for us, and unfortunately for Monokuma, his attempt to make Naegi pancakes to go along with his Awada butter seems not to go as smoothly as he'd hoped. 
with the Crusher block being halted at the last second by a reappearing alter ego, who, surprise surprise, seems to have implanted a sort of backdoor Trojan of themselves into the network before Monokuma destroyed the laptop in the previous chapter, effectively thwarting the execution in progress, and Naegi, still alive, is flung into the underground trash heap, surviving I assume by being cushioned by all of the garbage. Disgusting, sure, but it does mean that he didn't get crushed to death, so yeah, I'd take that chance too. Absolutely losing his mind for a second at his failure to kill Nayagi, Monokuma tries to imply that everything will be fine now with Nayagi trapped underground. But honestly, it's easy to see how badly this has got him shaken up. It's absolutely sweetly cathartic to see this tool who's been cartoonishly parading around, condescending to you, condescending to your emotions, your outrage, and your grief, who's always so cleanly confident in everything he says and does, and laughing in your face all the while, to really face some serious consequences for a legitimate blunder. The amount of pure, unmitigated schadenfreude here is to die for, or perhaps not to die for. It's just very satisfying to see him losing his grip on the situation, trying his best to wrangle his game face back on and gloat that actually this is even better than what he had in mind originally, as if he's not clearly seething inside. A plus material, so good. One of the most satisfying outcomes to a chapter so far. And clearly Kirigiri agrees with me because despite his bravado and bluster, she perfectly points out what's in store for us now, saying that it's not they, the students, who are ensnared. It's the mastermind. Picking back up with Naegi, we see him awaken in the garbage dump. Remains are scattered around of many different things, including the rocket whose strange execution of an unidentified man we saw at the very beginning of the game. Of course, Naegi has no reason to recognize that and no reason not to just conserve his energy for the moment, sleeping until finally Kirigiri arrives, having snuck herself into a load of trash so she could descend and break you out an atonement for abandoning you. Naegi is quick to suggest that, no, it's okay, Kirigiri, you didn't abandon me, I understand. To which she replies, no, dude, I totally abandoned you. I packed it up. I was like, RIP to him, but I'm different. But also, like, my bad about that. Won't happen again. She also reveals to you that bits of her memory have returned, namely that she's the super high school level detective and that she initially came to this school to find her father, who is in fact the actual headmaster of Hope's Peak itself, a man by the name of Jin Kirigiri. Determined more than ever to discover the real identity of the mastermind and true face of super high school level despair, the one responsible for the apparent tragedy that led Hope's Peak to its closure and condemnation, Kirigiri affirms her belief in you, vowing to, together with you and everyone else, finally take down the mastermind once and for all. Ending chapter 5. Mystery-wise, I'd actually say the main appeal of this chapter isn't in its class trial, but in both its wealth of new information and its thematic strength. The clues surrounding the Academy's mystery are on full force display, and the admission of the television broadcast, along with the mysteriously masked Mukuro's deaths, try saying that three times fast, are huge intrigues that only add to the veritable pile of things we desire an explanation to, all of which we're now heading right for. This is the type of intermediary chapter that sets up a climax perfectly, and would be the type of story moment that, were I playing this back in school, I would sneak under the covers with headphones after bedtime to see through to its conclusion because of, losing valuable sleep in the process. That's about one of the greatest compliments I can give to the start of an adventure game's final act, really. And boy did Danganronpa really nail the beginning of its final act. But hold on tight, because now we've reached said climax. And if you thought chapter 5 was really pulling out all the stops... Chapter 6 is going to leave you breathless. We pick right back up with Kirigiri using her key to help us escape the garbage pit, while in the process she tells us more about her family. They're evidently a lineage of detectives who take great pride in their work, but live in secrecy, largely unheard of by most others. She gave up some of her detective's pride to be recognized by Hope's Peak so that she could enter the school and cut ties with her father when she did. Apparently, good old Jin Kirigiri didn't have any aspirations to follow in the footsteps of his family's detective trade, and despite being next in line to become family head, he cut himself off from them, leaving entirely once Kirigiri's mother passed away. He evidently had a huge argument with her grandfather, and then, despite her young age, left her behind there. Though she claims she's glad she was left, proud to inherit the trade her family so highly regarded, her bitterness at his departure also underlines the sort of hurt and neglect that must have caused her, something that's sure to be troubled by what's to come for her. Before we can get to that, though, we need to set up for our showdown. Returning to the gym, Naegi and Kirigiri confront Monokuma for his sham execution. The only way they're able to prevent Naegi from being executed once more is to appeal to Monokuma's pride and his attempt at sharing despair with the entire world with the broadcast he's got going. 
Kirigiri argues that Monokuma was so desperate to win that he broke his own rules, and that such a convenient victory is never one the audience watching outside would accept. In other words, by seeing Monokuma succumb to desperation and resort to trickery and cheating to achieve his ends, he will have admitted that he couldn't destroy all hope in a manner that was purely fair and square. Thoroughly taken by the bait and interested to see what results from their showdown, Monokuma agrees that they'll have a final round of investigation and trial where everyone remaining will be given a chance to leave alive if and only if they solve Mukuro Ikusaba's murder, the Mastermind's true identity, and all other remaining secrets of the school. A tall order, to be sure. And as usual, if they can't reach that final epiphany, a grim punishment awaits all of them for their failure. Accepting on everyone's behalf, Kirigiri and Nayagi successfully negotiate out a path to our final victory, and from there, we've certainly got a lot of work to do. Returning to the cafeteria, everyone is relieved to see that Nayagi is okay, an emotional moment that would be a bit more poignant if they didn't all immediately reel that he smells of garbage. Come on, guys. To be fair, though, we don't have a lot of time for hugs and reunion anyway, as everyone is quickly filled in on the gargantuan task they've got to achieve. They're also quick to take note that Monokuma mentioned how the game began with only 16 students entering Hope's Peak, and from the start has only involved them. This last bit of skepticism drives their need to investigate solo, but for what it's worth, they also all acknowledge that they'll cover ground more quickly this way. With all the doors unlocked for access, everybody gets to work. Checking the data center first, we finally find out what's behind that previously locked door with Monokuma on it. It's a mech-like piloting room which controls the spawn points and actions of all the Monokumas hidden throughout the school, and only upon leaving and getting locked out again by Monokuma do we realize that there was a hatch below the seat where the mastermind was hidden. Of course, he justifies the decision of locking the room by saying there was no way he could operate openly otherwise, and that the hatch couldn't have been opened from outside anyway, but it still feels like a tantalizing clue we just narrowly missed. Next is the Headmaster's room, which is a total mess, looking as though someone were combing every nook and cranny of it in a way uncharacteristic of someone who would already know where everything was, strengthening the idea that the Mastermind is not, in fact, the Headmaster. Looking around, however, we find that the report on Mukuro that Kirigiri grabbed was incomplete. In her haste, she only grabbed page one of two. The second one outlines how the Headmaster has suspicion of Mukuro's connection to super high school level despair, and how he needs to keep an eye on her for the sake of everyone's safety, even if he hates to suspect her as one of his own students. This solidifies that Mukuro was at least an accomplice to the Mastermind, but the reason behind why she would kill her still lingers. Rechecking the greenhouse next, we find that the tarp used to cover the body is from the previously locked bio lab, which seems a good point of interest to check out now that we have actual access to it. Inside, we find a huge refrigerator-like room being used as a makeshift morgue, containers filled with the bodies of everyone who has died so far, with each one being signified by a light that's on each case that's got a body in it. It seems there are nine lights on at the moment, but given that one of those drawers definitely contains Mukuro's body from the greenhouse, this doesn't quite seem to add up. From there, we make our way to the second floor of the dorms, an absolutely trashed and nearly unnavigable hellscape of destroyed rooms, rubble, and stray bloodstains. As if this place being uninhabitable wasn't enough of a reason to block it off, though, there's also quite a bit of compromising material to discover here. For starters, there's a private room for who appears to have been the headmaster containing a secret door guarded by the password system on his computer. Kirigiri claims to have tried everything she can think of, but hasn't yielded success, until Naegi approaches it with the suspicion in mind that he knows Kirigiri herself would never have wanted to believe. Typing in her name, the door finally opens, a grim expression of disbelief on her face as it does so. Inside are a couple of important things. More obviously, there's a brightly wrapped present box containing Jin's bones, no doubt left behind by the mastermind, finally establishing to us who the guy strapped to the rocket at the start of the game was. Behind, on a dresser, is a picture kept by Jin of himself holding Kirigiri when she was a happy, smiling child. Grimly, she expresses, Well, this is annoying. I came here to free myself of the past, and yet to now find something like this. So what do you expect me to do now? As we come to understand her conflict and pain, Naegi thinks to himself about this revelation with a line that just breaks my heart, to be honest. Knowing the headmaster had this picture all this time, he must have really cared about her. Realizing that with this, her plan to achieve closure by cutting her father off for abandoning her is ultimately impossible, the usually stoic and reserved Kirigiri asks for a bit of private time in this room, of which we happily give her considering the circumstances. In a desk drawer before we leave, we find an emergency e-handbook capable of opening anything guarded by a card reader, regardless of whose it is. 
Using this, we can finally get into some of the mysterious lockers further down in the hall. Inside, we find something truly confusing, a pocketbook of notes that seemingly belonged to Kirigiri, detailing her coming to the school and meeting her father, only to realize towards the end with hasty scribbled writing that they were already in the company of dangerous individuals, and also a locker definitely belonging to Hagakure, a notebook filled with his handwriting and tons of class notes proving he had to have taken classes here. Just as we wrap our heads around this, Monokuma calls everyone to the gym for a hint, and when we arrive to receive hours, we get a photo of the entire class happily together in a room without the barred windows. Well, everyone except for us, anyway. Now it seems like none of the others want to talk to us anymore, barring Kirigiri who deliberately decided not to take the bait and refrained from getting a hint from Monokuma in the first place. Speaking of Kirigiri, our last clue comes in the form of a DVD she found in the Headmaster's possessions, an interview reel with all of the students that none of them remember recording, where the Headmaster asked them all one by one if they would be okay with living out the rest of their lives in the school, and all of them agreeing to it. Stunned and confused by this revelation, you're unable to view the whole thing as a sudden power outage stops it in the middle, claimed by Monokuma to be totally by chance, but all evidence suggesting otherwise. With all this down, we head to the longest trial in the game, the ultimate solving of mysteries to end all mystery solving. And strap in folks, cause this one's quite the doozy. We firstly got to resolve the matter of everyone now being suspicious of one another, because they all received photos of a similar nature to Nayagi's, the common factor being that the person who received the photo is not in it. Pointing this out quickly gets everyone back on the same page, but at first they still don't believe the photos to be real, at which point they have to swallow a huge pill as Monokuma tells them they're totally real, and the discussion can't really continue until they figure out how that could be possible. If you've been paying attention so far, you'll likely have figured this out by this point. It all could only point to collective amnesia. But why? Why is it that everyone so conveniently had amnesia of their time together in Hope's Peak Academy? Well, it's rather simple, actually. Their memories were stolen away by the mastermind, and I actually really like the way Monokuma dismissively responds to being asked how he did it. If I said it was hypnotism, would you believe me? Or we opened up your skulls and messed with your brains? Would you really believe anything I said? How it happened doesn't matter right now. And he's right to be honest, explaining something like this at this point wouldn't change anything about the results or the fallout surrounding those actions. That explanation would basically only be of benefit to the audience, and Monokuma's effectively skipping over all the pseudoscience to get right to the story's actual emotional need. Namely, we've got to get back to the matter of Mukuro's untimely demise, which was obviously perpetrated by the Mastermind. Though there's some brief debate over whether the Mastermind is even in the school, the mention of the Monokuma control room is quick to establish that they most certainly are, now only leaving the question of who among the students could be the culprit behind everything. Clearly realizing it can't be anyone currently standing in the room due to just how contrived their methods of sneaking off would have to be, everyone quickly concludes that a student previously thought to be dead can be the only one. The real fatal injuries of Mukuro's body are determined to be the scattered cuts all over her, not the stabbing or the bludgeoning, as they were attempts to conceal the body's real cause of death. The wounds scattering her body are from several days prior, meaning that this could reasonably be one of the previously dead victims whom Mukuro took the place of and whose original counterpart is still alive and well. This is only further proven by the lights on the biolab drawers, as ten lights should be active, but only nine were when checked. We have to go over for a bit and determine who attacked Nayagi in the mask, of course, but it should be fairly obvious to everyone at this point that it was the Mastermind, whose hand notably didn't feature a wolf tattoo, and who would have had incentive to put that mask on Mukuro's corpse later, both to conceal the identity and trick everyone into making false assumptions about who exactly attacked Nayagi in the first place. Monokuma briefly tries to accuse Kirigiri of being the attacker, but she proves this isn't the case by reluctantly revealing the burn scars on her hands, underneath her gloves proving beyond a doubt that the attacker and herself don't match up. Of course, we can prove the body was one from the Biolab anyway, as the tarp used to carry it was from the Biolab. When considering all of this and Mukuro's wounds, it becomes obvious that the only person who could have been killed in such a manner was Junko Enoshima. Putting your deduction skills to the ultimate test, you reason out that Mukuro was disguised as Junko from the very start of the game, mingling with everyone whose memories were already wiped of their school years to trick them into thinking that she was Junko. After settling into the game, Mukuro, who was the Mastermind's accomplice, was then suddenly betrayed, explaining her words of disbelief when she was impaled by Monokuma's spears. From there, the Mastermind took her body to the Biolab where the rest would be stored, but then, in an attempt to forcibly corner Kirigiri or Naegi, brought it back out, using an elaborate disguise scene, fake wounds, and even blowing up the body to both conceal its original identity and get one or both of the thorns in their side killed. 
From there, they also made sure that Nagi couldn't watch the entire interview video, risking him seeing Junko's real face, and only made sure to hand out old student photos that had Junko's face obscured in them. By process of elimination, it seems the only student we thought to be previously dead that could benefit from all this would be none other than Junko Enoshima herself, the real one, who's been lurking around in secret ever since the disguised Mukuro took the fall in her place. And wouldn't you know it, that's exactly what the case happened to be, as by this point, the real Junko happily reveals herself, and she's a riot. A perfectly eccentric oddball who is so bored by everything that she can barely stand to act consistently for more than a few seconds at a time. She's brilliant, but she's also absurd. A completely cynical fetishist of despair who not only yearns for sorrow and misery for its own sake, but also because philosophically speaking, she believes it to be the natural way of the world. In a way, she reminds me of a more extreme example of the type of mood or social lethargy that gives way to the kind of defeatist attitudes responsible for trapping us all in cycles of real-life misery and injustice. If you convince yourself that the default setting of the world is to simply fall into despair, to fold before the might of that sorrow and cynicism, then why would you even feel the need to try at all? Why make the world better when it will always fall to ruin? Why stand for what's good when what's bad always wins eventually? I've heard some imply that Junko's motivations seem ultimately pretty shallow or cartoonish, but I think this in itself is sort of missing the point of her character. She embodies this sort of glass-half-empty form of edgy, unsympathetic exhaustion with the state of the world that is so potently effective at making many of those around us give up on positive change. To put it simply, Junko is the concept of a doomer taken to its most dramatic extreme, not only giving up on the world, but actively pushing it to its brink because of her lack of faith in even a shred of it. And it's that kind of tantalizing anger and lack of faith in those around us that fuels an outlook like that. One that, truth be told, is scarily easy to see yourself falling into given the right set of circumstances. Of course, that doesn't mean we'd all pilot a robot bear to make high school students kill each other. Some of that's just part of the brand, baby. But on a more personal level, I've known people who feel this way, whether they recognize that or not. How tempting is it to throw your hands up, to look at the state of everything around you and say, this is never getting better. Why even try at all? We're all going to die, and none of this will make any difference whatsoever. That's the kind of despair Junko embodies. It's the kind that has the potential to grow like a virus inside anyone it infects. And it's this knowledge, this understanding, that she fully embraces in converting others to her militant, malicious cause. When I see complaints that her personal motivations aren't better explained, or that her background isn't explored thoroughly enough to make it clear why she does this, I think back to a scene from the psychological thriller film directed by Mihail Haneke, Funny Games. I swear I'm going somewhere with this. The film is framed as a sort of home invasion horror movie, similar to many others. But in its clever use of fourth wall breaking and refusal to sate the audience's typical taste for carnage, it becomes a very deliberate reflection and criticism of media violence, stripping away the context and catharsis, leaving only the structure and the suffering, making us ultimately question the dedication we've put into watching something so purely miserable with no other merit to it. How far will we go to continue watching something like this purely for its own sake, in other words? Anyway, the film basically revolves around this average family being trapped and tortured in their own home by these two dudes who assume the names of Peter and Paul, though they alternate between several different inconsistent identifiers throughout the film's runtime. In a particularly notable scene, one I really want you to think with me about after all that stuff I just said about Junko and her role in the story, the father asks the boys why they're doing all of this to them. And Paul responds with a multitude of self-contradicting and asinine excuses slash backstories for it. All of them are mockeries, honestly. They're not even remotely satisfying explanations. But then he pulls the curtain back and exposes our priorities as an audience in the process. He admits that none of the things he just said were true, and then he asks the family, but simultaneously the audience, What would you like to hear? What would make you happy? None of what I said is true. You know that as well as I do. Come on, he's a spoiled little brat. He's jaded and disgusted by the emptiness of existence. Peter and Paul act throughout the film as agents for the audience's desire to see misery, murder, and chaos. They're tricksters who come into existence solely to enact the violent acts we see on screen. And in doing so without giving us the satisfaction of some kind of tragic backstory, they notably rob us of the ability to get lost in the film's fiction. They intentionally make us sit with our own desire as an audience to have seen exactly what we're seeing right now. And to me, I feel like Junko is sort of similar. Not exactly the same, necessarily. I don't think Tanganrampa is asking us not to get invested in its fiction. In fact, its many twists, turns, and relative internal consistency prove the exact opposite. 
But it's this specific decision that really proves Junko's specific story function to me. No explanation could be good enough for what she's done. Lingering on that explanation would just be detracting from the severity of it at this point. All that's important is that she's given up on the world, and in doing so, she's doomed it to end. Oh right, did I mention that before? Yeah, we've kinda gotta get back to the whole trial thing we were talking about. More thematic junk after. Anywho, in short form, we not only get the admission that Junko and Mukuro were twins, and that Junko killed her own sister, not only the reveal that she erased our two years worth of memories of school life and forced us to kill people we already knew and cared about, but also the real kicker, that the outside world we were so desperate to escape into was already driven into being a total apocalyptic wasteland a year prior to all this. Something that prior to their memory wipe, everybody already knew of and willingly sequestered themselves inside to survive. The Headmaster's plan to protect everyone from said despair-induced apocalypse was thwarted, however, as by the time he started taking countermeasures, Junko and Mukuro had already been in Class 78 for a full year, and went to work sabotaging everything from the inside, killing the Headmaster, prepping their killing game, and then wiping everyone's memories so that they would participate in it. A truly perverse and maniacal plot, to be sure. Oh yeah, also Togami's entire lineage was annihilated, so he's the only one of them left now. Uh, get wrecked, I guess? I, I don't know, maybe I feel a bit sorry for him now, actually. This all too is confirmed by Genocider Sho, who, because of her not sharing her memory with Fukawa, is able to actually recall brief snippets of the tragedy, at least enough to confirm its truthfulness. Unfortunately, considering Fukawa was the one who mostly experienced it, she doesn't have many details on the process, and neither does anyone else, thanks to their wiped memories, effectively leaving the way this all happened relatively ambiguous, at least in this installment. Junko then brilliantly cements my suspicions about her character's role in this story, and the apocalypse she caused's role in this story here as well, responding to Kirigiri's frantic inquiry over whether this world-destroying event was concocted by some kind of powerful group, mob, or family, that actually, it was none of those things, really. How can I put it, she says. It was more of an ideological thing. Despair is contagious, you know? It's almost like a natural phenomenon. Everyone is capable of it. And now the entire world has fallen into despair. In other words, if you see despair as the enemy, then your enemy is the world itself. Ultimately, this whole killing game is revealed to have been orchestrated for the sole purpose of getting her message across to people even more concretely. As Junko explains, there are still stragglers in the world who believe in a future beyond all of this, a hope burning in their hearts that it will one day improve, will one day end. This killing game was solely constructed so it could be broadcast to those people. Either it would break their spirits from afar and force them to concede to the mob of misery like everyone else, or they would be foolhardy enough to come rushing to Hope's Peak to save the students, something Junko was quick to point out has happened and gotten them all gunned down by her security apparatuses in the process. In forcing everyone in the world to witness the students of Hope's Peak, the symbol of the entire world's future hope and prosperity, kill each other for such selfish and petty reasons, she's effectively twisted its entire image, used it as a beacon of despair that will prove her own cynical worldview once and for all, to prove to every human on Earth that the glass will always be half empty. She even expected everyone to reach this truth eventually, resisted their efforts to scrape towards the truth for the drama of it all, but knew that they inevitably would crumple at the gravity of it all once they got here. And it seems they really are starting to. The truth, as I said before, doesn't always lead to what's happiest or best for everyone. Because while the truth can give plenty of hope, despair is the other side of that same coin, ready to flip back over at any time. Except... It can always flip again. Because as Naegi so eloquently points out, Junko has only been going on and on about her own way of looking at the world this entire time. He says that he hasn't seen the outside world with his own eyes to know if her characterization is accurate. And even if it is, the state of it does not point to her single seemingly objective truth. What is the truth, really? The definition changes from person to person, occasion to occasion. As immutable as it often seems, our understandings inform our truths for there are as many of them as there are people. And this truth, that the world outside is irreversibly and utterly destroyed, doesn't have to be the truth. Or at the very least, it doesn't have to stay the truth. For as cynically determined as Junko is to hold on to that mindset, that despair takes root in all things, that all hopes will eventually come crashing down below the tide of reality, reality is just as capable of spreading that hope in the end. With the combined power of people who haven't given up on that future, who do see the world as worth fighting for, they can always ensure that despite every overwhelming odd facing them, there's just as much of a chance to get back up and right those wrongs all over again, no matter how long it takes to do so. 
It's radical action, it's belief, it's unification with your fellow man, and it's hope. Bewildered by his resistance, but not at all convinced just yet that he has a chance, Junko proposes a final vote. This vote is between both sides of a single debate, of hope versus despair. If even a single person is unsure enough to vote to convict hope, their coalition will crumble, and despair will win, mirroring perfectly the way our unification is constantly under assault by the plethora of anxieties held over our heads societally. This will also lead to the figurehead and representative of hope, in this case Nayagi, being executed gruesomely, with everyone else forced to live out the rest of their lives peacefully in the school without incident, in deference to Junko's will. However, if everyone simultaneously votes to convict the side of despair, then Junko will execute herself, the third floor's air purifier switching off and driving them out into the newly accessible outside world, where she swears they will be unable to survive due to the ongoing worldwide societal collapse. Though at first it seems everyone might be ready to throw in the towel, you use your absorb feature to add the very concept of hope to your truth bullets, going through and rallying your friends one by one, reminding them of the merit there is in belief, union, and their own ability to change the world together, even if it has come crashing down. Because there's always people left to pick up the pieces, and they can be those people if they try. Finally swayed to stand with you, it seems Junko is finally defeated. Though her ideology is, in that moment, dismantled, it still has only clearly fallen in the eyes of the survivors standing in this room. Convincing the entire world is going to be a massive undertaking, which she wonders if they'll really be able to accomplish considering its scope. If you guys want to get all hung up on the word hope, that's no skin off my nose, she says. But just be warned. From this point on, one despair after another will stand in your way. No matter where you run, no matter where you hide. Maybe you'll find some hope, but there is a very fine line dividing that hope from bitter despair. With those thoughts left imparted, she shuttles off to her own self-imposed death, violently resisting Nayagi's words that he has no actual desire to see her killed. Until the very end, she's convinced herself that the pure erasure of death is the greatest reward she could ever get. That that final silent castaway into pure irrelevance is itself the greatest embodiment of her ideology, her way of life, and her dedication to it. Enduring a mini-sized version of every execution she's doled out until now, Junko Enoshima finally lands on the conveyor belt she failed to kill Hope with. And when the block hesitates for just a moment, her grin fades into what might be a final, animal wish to survive before that mechanism, loaded with all the weight of the despair she so championed, comes crashing down, ending the Mastermind's life, once and for all. So ends the final class trial, the final chapter, and life at Hope's Peak. So begins a new journey, as one comes to its close. Finally, at the end of a long journey, everyone takes the escape button dropped by Junko at the moment of her death and takes it to the main hall. There, they briefly reminisce about everything that's happened and talk about what will happen moving forward. Unified by their experiences, they all make sure to let each other know that they'll always be available for each other. And despite their uncertainties, despite their anxieties, despite all the promises of despair waiting for them that Junko left behind, they decide to go anyway, because they never know what will be waiting for them on the other side of that door, or how they too could be a part of making it better. Because when everyone's hands are joined, what may seem impossible for one becomes possible for many. No matter what it looks like, Nagi says, it's still our world. It's where we're meant to live. And how do I put this? Unlike this school, the world is really big, right? Since it's so big, I'm sure there must be some despair no matter what but there also has to be lots of hope, right? Solidifying that the true meaning of hope is in searching for it, to try to find it, everyone stands firm as Nagi hovers his hand over that button signifying their freedom, their decision to emerge into an uncertain world rife with danger. Here, in these final few moments, Nagi's internal monologue really touches on something important to me, instrumental to me, in fact. It summarizes what I think this whole game has always been about. But what can we do? There's so few of us, and we're so small. So what can we do? No. We can probably do anything. The door began to open. With my hands. With our hands. Hope and despair mingled together, opening the door to the future. As the button is pressed, the giant locked door at the main entrance finally begins to spread. And as light pours in, the outside left truly ambiguous until the very end. The frame is engulfed in that light and Danganronpa comes to its close. 
Aside from a sequel tease at the end of the credits, with Monokuma still being active without Junko to control him, of course. What? Gotta encourage people to keep buying copies somehow. I've heard many say that the ambiguity of this ending is frustrating, or that, at the very least, it's incomplete without playing Danganronpa 2. But I disagree. When I read this story for the first time, the second game was largely out of our reach in the West. Translations didn't really exist, or at least what did was incomplete. Think about the people who played this originally on the PSP, too. Those people didn't have any kind of guarantee of a sequel coming their way, and neither did Spike when they put their faith in this product, really. So then, if this ending is truly as incomplete as some would imply, why would they put that much faith in it? Why would they decide, at the very end, that this ambiguity stands well enough on its own? In my opinion, it's simple, really. Because the state of the world outside was never the point. Like Schrodinger's cat box, it's something that existed to be speculated upon at the time, but whether you believed it to be one way or the other, the discussion surrounding it was always the main point, right? To believe in that unity, to believe in that hope, despite no real evidence to suggest things would go well for them. That is the core conceit of hope that Danganronpa so strongly pushes for in the face of overwhelming, often inescapable, hardship. The truth is a fickle thing. It would have been easy to show us a final screen of what laid ahead of the students, but they didn't, because that lack of ambiguity would itself imply some kind of truth, one that many would take as a clear-cut answer that Junko was right. But even if the world did indeed turn out to be ravaged by despair, brought to its knees and full of danger, who's to say it has to stay that way? Who's to say it can't be fixed? That's why seeing it isn't what matters here. What matters is only what the cast have set their hearts on doing about it. One way or another, what matters is their hopes. Danganronpa Trigger Happy Havoc, or as I knew of it when first hearing of it, Danganronpa Academy of Hope and High School Students of Despair, is a peculiar game. It's got its fair share of serious problems that I've gone over. Not every game mechanic is as well-baked as it perhaps should have been. Some of its worst bits, I think, have the capability to be seriously cruel and tasteless. It's got some wonderful art direction and music, but it also sometimes suffers from a lack of foresight with its pacing, and occasionally, its mystery elements leave a little something to be desired. But when Danganronpa is good, it excels. Its characters are memorable, charming, and full of depth. Its atmosphere is effective, chilling, and claustrophobic. And its themes, its villain, its core conceit, that will all stick with me until the day I die. Because as ham-fisted and anime-esque as it may at times seem, Danganronpa was, from the very beginning, a game not just about the worst humanity was capable of, but also its undying capability to face those things head-on, to identify and acknowledge them, and to overcome them, to always remain vigilant, to never concede to boredom or despair, and every time those problems arose, to know that we are capable, together, of fixing them. Danganronpa was somewhat formative to me, and maybe nowadays that's a bit embarrassing to admit but I will always hold it close to my heart for the reasons I've outlined, even if I will still definitely hold its feet to the fire for the things I think it legitimately screwed up. Perhaps that imperfection remains a bit much for some, and I can totally understand that. It's not a series I think will be navigable for everyone, and that's okay. But for those of us who could, or still can, I think there's a lot of value here that has ensured Danganronpa's stay in the pantheon of pop culture. It's why it's even now getting attention with new ports, merchandise, and fan work, despite its relative silence in the way of any intended future endeavors. Danganronpa is flawed, yes, but it, like many other flawed things, is also a classic. And at the end of the day, that's why it still matters to me. The red moon a waver ring, the sky sad colored scene, like a bird that can never find its way home anymore. You're just like a cat screeching, calling friends to a secret scene. Your voice a maddening cry in some old alley. What is it you hope to see? Laying your head upon your knees, hugging up to them while you stare ahead so emptily. It's not out the window, see? The love that's left for you and me. I promise it wasn't a ghost or trickery. So how long are you going to sit right there? If you don't run after that love right now, it's never going to come back. The boundless age, your sky is waiting up ahead. So show me your heart that has bled and bled. Hold on to every little moment that you may 
Don't take for granted and live for today Oh angel, take a breath and soar on up above You'll find the place that you've been dreaming of Your tattered wings, you can just cast them right aside And fly on as you please Hi everyone, thanks so much for watching. This video was an absolute doozy to make, so please make sure to give it a like and a comment to help it succeed with YouTube's algorithm. I'd really, seriously appreciate that. This is the proposed first part of a retrospective I'd like to do about the rest of this franchise as well, but again, that will depend entirely on how well this video performs for my channel. So if you want to see this whole shebang continue, please do consider sharing this video around or with your friends. If you want other ways to help me, you can subscribe and ring the bell if you haven't already, follow my socials linked down below, and join my Patreon if you'd like to support the continued creation of my work in the future. Thank you so much again to Opera GX for the sponsor, to you all for watching, and I hope you all have a very happy holiday season. Peace.